Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 15677 in the name of Edward Mountain on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on its inquiry into salmon farming in Scotland. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Edward Mountain to speak to unmove the motion. Convener, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And before I open this debate on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I'd like to refer members to my register of interest, and sp specifically in relation to the interest in a wild salmon fishery. I'd also like to pay special thanks to our clerking team and the team from SPICE who supported us during the inquiry. They have responded to the particular challenges of this inquiry with a, professional, with a, with a professionalism which has allowed the production of a very detailed report. During the course of 2018, presiding officer, the committee conducted a, an in-depth inquiry into salmon farming in Scotland. Our inquiry was prompted by a public petition on the impact of the farmed salmon sector on wild salmon stocks. But it was clear that the problem went beyond this. Thus, in, the, our inquiry looked at further matters. We looked at the current state of the salmon farming industry in Scotland. We identified opportunities for its future development and explored how the various fish health and environmental challenges could be addressed. We took oral evidence from the industry representatives, research bodies, environmental organizations, HIE, and all the regulatory bodies. We were also extremely grateful for those organizations and individuals who took the time to submit detailed and often technical written submissions to inform our deliberation. The committee's inquiry was also informed by an important piece of work carried out in advance of our wider inquiry by the Eclair Committee on the impact of salmon farming on the marine environment. We were extremely grateful for the valuable contribution which to me demonstrated the benefit of working jointly together by two committees. The committee was also made aware of a range of relevant activity by the Scottish Government and SEPA and the salmon industry which occurred after we had finished taking evidence. This included the publication of the Scottish Government's 10-year farmed fish health framework in May 2018, the announcement of a salmon interactions working group in June 2018 which will examine and provide advice on the interactions between wild and farmed salmon, and the publication of a FinFish aquisector, aquaculture sector plan by SEPA in November 2018. And both the Scottish Government and SEPA provided responses to the committee's report just last week. Now, there are some key messages and recommendations in the report I would like to highlight. Firstly, though, I would like to make it clear that the committee acknowledges both the economic and social value that the salmon farming industry brings to Scotland. It provides jobs in rural areas, investment and spend into local communities and stimulates economic activity in the wider supply chain. The committee, however, does not believe that the contribution made by the industry to the Scottish economy should be allowed to mask any negative impact on the environment and I will touch on some of these specific issues later. Now, it is clear to the committee that the industry wishes to expand. However, the committee strongly agrees with the views of the Eclair Committee that until they can demonstrate that they are truly good neighbours, it is not appropriate to do so. The industry needs to rise to the challenges that they face regarding fish health and the environment. And to do so, the committee feels that the status quo in terms of regulation and enforcement is not acceptable. This view was shared by the majority of stakeholders, including industry representative, representatives and importantly by the Scottish Government in its response to our report. The committee is therefore of the view that urgent and meaningful action needs to be taken to address the regulatory deficiencies, to raise the bar for the industry and thus protect our environment and the industry's future. The committee is also firmly of the view that a stricter regulatory and concentering regime that is fair and proportionate can only benefit the sector, helping to drive improvement 
and giving it confidence that it is meeting its environmental responsibilities. Let us be clear, the reputation of Scottish salmon as a premium product must be maintained. The committee is in no doubt that consumers and market see Scotland as a producer that meets the highest international production and fish health and environmental standards. We must ensure that this continues. The committee therefore welcomes that some of the key producers have recognised the benefits that enhanced regulation would bring to their product and are thus reporting the, uh, supporting the recommendations that we have made. Now I want to look at sea lice. This is an issue that the industry has to accept that currently neither chemicals nor cleaner fish can solve totally. We strongly believe that there should be mandatory and timely approach to the reporting of sea lice infestations. We recommended a compliance policy that is robust and enforceable with appropriate penalties. And I note from the Scottish Government's response that it is already reviewing the farm fish sea lice compliance policy, which it anticipates completing in the spring. Whilst this exercise considers the mandatory reporting of sea lice levels from March 2019, it will only be done monthly in arrears. In other countries where our key producers operate, it is done weekly in arrears. One therefore has to ask why the government is content to achieve less. The overall work is positive, but there can be no halfway house in what it delivers. And whilst we acknowledge the, it, the work the industry is doing, there is a great deal of work still to be undertaken to sac tackle the sea lice problem. Turning to farm salmon mortalities, the committee and the industry believe that the current level of farmed fish mortality is too high. Losing 20 to 25 percent of all fish put to sea is not acceptable. The committee believes that no expansion should be permitted at sites which report high or significant increased levels of mortality until health issues are addressed to the satisfaction of the regulators. The Scottish Government has said that it will publish mortality reports monthly in arrears and will consider options around web-based and real-time site reporting on mortality. It has also said it will consider a broader review to the transportation and disposal of dead fish. Again, this is a welcome step forward on reporting, but Scotland is in danger of again setting a lower bar than achieved by other producers, our key producers elsewhere. It is, however, disappointing that the Scottish Government does not consider that there should be on the restriction on expansion of sites with high mortality. Now, turning to environmental regulation, the committee shares the view of the, of the Eclair Committee that the regulatory tools available to SEPA are neither adequate or effective. The Eclair Committee recognised that SEPA had not been performing well in monitoring or enforcing the, the regulations. This is our view as well. The sector has shown very poor rates of compliance with SEPA's current standards. This is borne out by the results of the SEPA compliance assessment process of 2017 which showed an increase in the number of salmon farms which had failed to meet the required standards. The committee is clear, SEPA must respond to their failures. I'm sure the committee will want to monitor the progress in this area with interest. <coughs> now looking at the location of salmon farms, the committee made several important recommendations. The need for a precautionary approach to applications for new sites and the expansion of sites, a need to locate new farms in more suitable areas away from wild salmon migratory routes, and a more strategic approach should be taken to identify areas across Scotland that are either suitable or unsuitable for the sighting of salmon farms, and work to move existing poorly sighted farms to more suitable sites. We called on the Scottish Government to provide strong and clear leadership to ensure these actions are taken. However, it is a concern that in its response it suggests that the government says that the precautionary principle has and will continue to be applied in a meaningful and effective manner. This is not what the committee heard in the evidence we received. Our report... Yes, I will. John Meeson. It, it was just on that point, I wonder if the uh, convener of the committee would accept that we did actually hear evidence on both sides of that, that some people said the precautionary principle was being applied and some people said it wasn't. Edward Mountain. I absolutely do believe that some people said 
uh, the, the, the was precautionary principle was being followed. But as a generality, there were more saying that it wasn't than, there were, than it was. To go on, our report does not support business as usual. And I don't believe that that's what the government or industry should be promoting. Now, before I finish, I believe it's incumbent upon me, convener, to highlight the committee's concerns about leaks to the media which, which occurred when considering our draft report. These were clearly identified by the media outlet concerned as having come from a member of the committee. And these leaks were sustained over several weeks. Indeed, a journalist showed me private papers from a committee meeting that had only been circulated to members an hour or so before I was approached. The member who leaked the papers made comment, did so knowing full well that it was unlikely they would be identified. Their actions significantly delayed, delayed the committee's consideration of the draft report. But worse still, it caused a level of mistrust within the committee regarding private papers and private discussions. While leaks, of course, presiding officer, are a matter of the code of conduct, unless a member is identified, no action can be taken. As convener of this committee and a firm believer in the importance and the integrity of this parliament, I believe that the incident is totally unacceptable. I therefore would suggest that the parliament consider strengthening the code of conduct in, the area, in this area. Now, I've made no public comment on the unsubstantiated personal attacks that were made as a result of the leaks and I will not do so now. But I would like to say something directly to the person who leaked the private papers and made the comments to the press. You should reflect carefully on what you've done, because I believe you have let the parliament down, you have let the committee down, and perhaps more importantly, you have let yourself down. In conclusion, presiding officer, I've mentioned some of the key points of the report and there are many other issues that I'm sure will be picked up and discussed by other members. We have a real opportunity here to build on the broad support the report has received. But we need to be clear, this report and the Eclair report does not support business as usual. So neither should the government or the industry. To do so would be to disadvantage Scotland, our salmon producers, and damage our reputation as a quality food producer, and also potentially harm the environment. I look forward, presiding officer, to what will, I hope will be a lively and progressive de debate. And, presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mountain. I now call on Julia Martin to behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Convener, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Mr. Chapman. My timing's wrong. It, it's very kind of you to do it in public, Mr. Apologies, Chapman. A, a note to me would have been sufficient, but there you go. That's very kind. But it's not off your time. Don't look like that. So you get your time back. Thank you very much, presiding officer. You can read my mind. There's a slight uneasiness in speaking to an inquiry report that was published before you took the convener post on, but I want to put on record my thanks to the member who was the convener at the time of the inquiry and report, Graham Day. Um, and to also to the committee clerks for the work they did then, but I'm in now in bringing me up to speed with developments since the report was published. Set against the background of the plans to extend production in the aquaculture industry to uh, 300,000 to 400,000 tonnes by 2030, the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and REC committees jointly commissioned a review of the scientific evidence on the environmental effects of salmon farming in Scotland. And I want to pay tribute to the Rural Economy Committee who've done, who have taken many of the recommendations in our report and done a great deal of work, a great deal of further work on the topic from their perspective. And I echo Edward Mountain's comments on the merits of joint committee working. A year has passed since the Environment Committee's report and it's fair to say a lot has happened. But before I go on to talk about specifically about our findings and recommendations, I want to say this that salmon farming has done three very important things for this country. It's made salmon affordable for households. When I was growing up, salmon was something you got in a tin mashed up and spread thinly on sandwiches at a christening. Now, that's the, now that rich source of protein in omega-3s is an alternative, affordable, healthy, fresh option that's no longer the preserve of special occasions. 
Secondly, salmon farming is a massive economic contributor to Scotland's economy, particularly in our worldwide exports and job creations, particularly in rural areas, as has been mentioned. And its quality is respected the world over. But most pertinently to the portfolio of my committee, salmon farming is one of the lowest emission farming methods. And I think that that's often a point that's missed when we discuss it. The importance of this industry is why inquiries like those of the two committees are so important as we move forward to expand the sector and enhance, protect our global reputation and protect the environment that supports the sector. The Scottish Government Commission's report of 2002 addressed six main areas of environmental imp impact, which are the disease impacts on wild and farm stocks, including the impact of sea lice, the discharge of waste nutrients and their inter interaction in the wider marine environment, the effects of discharges of medicines and chemicals from salmon farming, escapes from fish farms and the potential effects on well populations, the sustainability of feed supplies and the emerging environmental impacts, including on well, grass and marine animals. The committee heard from the industry, regulators, communities and NGOs before reporting to the REC committee ahead of its inquiry. And the committee was mindful that rapid development and growth of the sector could take place without a full... Um, Sorry, the committee was mindful that rapid development and growth of the sector could not take place without a full understanding of these environmental impacts and aimed to shine a light on these in order for a debate to open up, identifying areas for improvement and action. It's clear the same set of concerns regarding the environmental impact of salmon farming are the same as in 2002. Many of our stakeholders pointed to the lack of focus on the application of the precautionary principle in the development and expansion of the sector. Scotland's at a critical point in considering how salmon farming develops in a sustainable way in relation to the environment, whilst at the same time delivering the substantial benefits that I outlined in the beginning of my speech. Our inquiry also found that there are significant gaps in the knowledge, data, monitoring and research around the potential risk the sector poses to ecosystem functions, the resilience and the supply of the ecosystem services. Further information is necessary in order to set realistic targets for the industry that fall within environmental limits. And we recommended that there should be a requirement for the industry to fund independent and independently verified research and development needed. The role, responsibilities and interaction of agencies requires review and agencies need to be appropriately funded and resourced to fully meet their environmental duties and obligations. Scotland's public bodies have a duty to protect biodiversity and this must be to the fore when considering the expansion of the sector. The committee saw a need to progress on the, on the basis of the precautionary principle and asked the relevant agencies to work together more effectively in that regard. The committee also identified the need for the farming industry to demonstrate it can effectively manage and mitigate its impacts on the environment, in particular adaptive management, which takes account of the precautionary principle using real-time farm-by-farm data could have the potential to reduce environmental impacts. The committee called for an ecosystems-based approach to planning the industry's growth and development in both the marine and freshwater environment, identifying where salmon farming can take place and what the carrying capacity of that environment is. The committee also wanted to see independent research commissioned, including a full cost-benefit analysis of recirculating aquaculture systems and a comparative analysis with the sector as it currently operates in Scotland, alongside further development and implementation of alternative technical solutions, supported by the use of incentives. The committee found the current consenting and regulatory framework inadequate to address environmental issues. In particular, the approach to sanctions and enforcement, something that won't affect the majority of responsible farmers, but can tackle those few operators who may damage their sector's reputation if not dealt with appropriately. The committee recognises that there have been considerable further discussion on many of these issues since they reported last year and a great deal of government-led action. We welcome the conclusions of the REC committee, which support our findings and the continuing work being done in government agencies to address them. Both committees would like to see a full commitment and a necessary urgency across the industry, agencies and government to address the complex challenges we have jointly highlighted. highlighted. Immediate mandatory reporting on sea lice and, uh, is still under review and we look forward to strategic guidance on the siting of fish farms and revisions to the consenting and regulatory framework. 
the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, alongside the REC Committee, will continue to examine with great interest the actions of the industry, agencies and Scottish Government in responding to the challenges to ensure our marine and freshwater environments are being afforded the necessary protections amid the growth of a hugely important sector in Scotland. Thank you very much. I now call Fergus Ewing to open with the Government Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, Presiding officer, I, I hope uh, that I have never stood here in this position ill prepared for the debate ahead, but I do feel particularly well prepared today, having enjoyed a lunch of prime Scots salmon. Um, Presiding officer, let me put on record uh, my um, a lunch in my office, I have to say, <laughs> not a posh affair. Uh, let me put on record. Uh, my and my cabinet colleague, Rosanna Cunningham, who's listening to this debate, appreciation of the diligence of the members of both committees in their inquiries into the salmon farming sector. Um, as indicated in our response uh, to the uh, League Committee, we acknowledge and accept much of their conclusions and recommendations. Uh, and I want to make it absolutely clear, this government's support for the farm salmon and wider agriculture sectors and their sustainable growth. We do need to get more, do more to get the balance right to protect the environment, and we acknowledge that the status quo is not an option. Salmon farming is one of Scotland's success stories. The sector is a global player as the world's third largest salmon producer. According to Highlands and Islands Enterprise analysis uh, in 2017, 10,340 jobs across Scotland were dependent on salmon farming and its supply chain, generating 540 million pounds in gross value added and providing wages worth some 271 million. But these are the, ma the, the macro stats on an individual level, people in constituencies such as that of my colleagues, Kate Forbes and Gail Ross, and. Uh, of uh, Mr. Scott and Shetland, Mr. MacArthur and Orkney, uh, there's a great many people whose livelihoods are sustained by this modern Scottish industry. And I'm sure all members will recognize the importance of that. And Scottish farm salmon has become a key contributor to the food and drink success, attracting a premium from Broston to Brussels. It's Scotland's biggest food export with sales in 2017 of 600 million pounds to more than 50 countries worldwide. The industry has reinvigorated and re-energized many of our coastal, island, and remote rural communities. And this is a catalyst for vital improvements in social infrastructure, housing, transport, and broadband. The sector has also constantly innovated in husbandry and farm management recognizing that continuous improvements in fish health and environmental impact are a win-win for aquaculture and other marine and coastal industries. Indeed, aquaculture is responsible for some of the biggest infrastructure investment in Scotland in recent times, thereby creating a broader supply chain of significant value. Capital investment by the sector is around 63 million pounds annually. Recently, there has been a significant amount of investment, such as Mowee, formerly Marine Harvests, Kailakin Feed Plant on Skye, and Scottish Sea Farms Hatchery near Oban with a cumulative price tag of over 150 million pounds. Investments, incidentally, that contribute towards improved fish health by increasing the length of time spent in hatchery and reducing the amount of time spent at sea, thereby stronger when they enter the cages at sea. C. Moreover, the salmon sector has created supply chain and processing opportunities and jobs elsewhere in Scotland, from Stornoway to Resyth. There's no doubt that salmon farming plays a key role in our ambitions for our nation. It's also a low carbon industry with a low carbon footprint, producing, uh, as Gillian Martin said, high protein, healthy food products that are increasingly affordable to domestic consumers, including children through school meals. It's helping deliver our STEM st strategy objectives with investment and innovation in research and development in our higher education institutions. This government wants to support the key role agriculture plays in attracting more young people to live and work in rural and remote rural areas. So I'm pleased to announce today, presenting officer, that we are working through the Agriculture Industry 
leadership group to develop with Skills Development Scotland, uh, the Scottish Aquaculture Information Centre, Lantra and others, an aquaculture skills plan to support young people into the sector. We can also be proud of the global nature of our role in this industry. The director of SAIC, Heather Jones, recently contributed to an expert group in Canada to look at how to address the industry challenges. And we too must learn from other countries and their approach to sustainable farming, as members already have alluded to in their addresses on behalf of the committee. And I'm pleased to announce that in March, Scotland will host a meeting of EU and Northern European fish health inspectors and experts. We want the sector's economic contribution to grow, but we recognize that it must develop sustainably with appropriate regulatory frameworks which minimize and address environmental impacts. We are already taking steps to ensure an appropriate balance is achieved. Firstly, we have established a wild salmon interactions work stream under an independent chair, John Goodlad, to consider the relationship between and impact of farmed salmon on wild salmon. The group has been tasked with proposing an improved set of arrangements and we expect to receive the group's recommendations later this year. Of course, we must keep in mind that there is no single cause for the decline in wild salmon numbers across all parts of Scotland and indeed the Northeast Atlantic. That is why the group will eventually explore other pressures bearing down on wild salmon, including climate change, predation, angling or man-made barriers in our rivers. Secondly, we have published a 10-year farmed fish health framework with four working groups which have been up and running since autumn last year and are making good progress. In particular, we recognise the concerns expressed about mortalities and the links to sea lice, which is why it is one of the key work streams. Control of sea lice on farms has improved. The most recent analysis available from Marine Scotland Science shows a decline over the four years from 2014 to 2017, but we are not complacent. There is more to do. And I can advise today that we will... Yes, certainly. John Finney. Thank you, thank you, President. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention on that point. And I'm pleased that you, you came to, uh, of course, there's a lot of good news and that's welcome, but you came to the issue of mortality uh, rates, Cabinet Secretary. In any other industry, um, if there was that level of uh, mortality, there would be significant interventions. Do you believe that there's been robust enough interventions from the Scottish Government to address that issue? Well, I'll come to mortality in a minute. I was actually dealing with, with sea lice, and I just want to finish. I'll come to mortality in a moment, but the point about sea lice is important. So I can advise today that we will complete a review of our sea lice, sea lice compliance regime this spring. And it's also important to say that I expect, although I'm not prejudging the outcome of that review, it is a review conducted by experts, and it's evidence-based, and that is absolutely appropriate and rightly so. But I do expect that the regime will be tightened, providing assurance to all interests, including fish farm businesses, that our fish health inspectorate is working effectively to tackle sea lice infestations. Uh, and finally, and independently of government, SIPA has published its draft sectoral fin fish plan and its own response to the REC committee. Mr. Finney asked about mortalities. I'm pleased to see that mortalities are also reducing uh, 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 in many instances, as have sea lice numbers. However, again, we are not complacent and more needs to be done. And that's precisely why the fish health framework, which I mentioned, and the four groups, uh, which have been doing a huge amount of work, are also considering that matter. And we are going to be taking interim steps in order uh, to uh, deliver an environmental monitoring plan to be delivered as a condition of any consent for marine aquaculture planning applications. Uh, Signing officer, it's key going forward that everyone has confidence in a regulatory framework which encompasses the principles of adaptive management, of best use of scientific evidence, and clear advice to decision makers which stands up to scrutiny. I see that my time is running dry, and therefore I will skip three pages <laughs> of my speech I'm out of sorry, consideration to you I'm and sure perhaps everyone's others, presiding it. officer. <laughs> Let me just say I look forward to the debate uh, with great interest and enjoyment, and I'll be very happy and keen to reply to points that members may make in the course of it.
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, call Donald Cameron for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I begin by referring to my register of interest and to both fish farming and wild fishing? I should also state from the start that I was on the Eclair Committee when it authored its report on salmon farming and was also the Eclair Committee's rapporteur to the REC Committee during the REC Committee's uh, evidence sessions. It was an honour an honor to work on the Eclair report, and whilst at times challenging, I certainly emerged with res great respect for other MSP colleagues, uh, many of whom are in the chamber today, uh, as we combined collectively to produce that report. And can I particularly mention um, the departed Graham Day, uh, in, especially. Um, departed as, as in terms of departed, <laughs> departed from the committee. <laughs> hey, um, Hale and hearty, hale and hearty, nevertheless. But um, Gillian Martin obviously has hit the ground running, as she mm. showed by, by her speech. Um, Presiding officer, usually I don't like to dwell on my register of interest for, for obvious reasons. Um, but today I'd like to make an exception to, to that. Uh, not least because I hope from personal experience to explain one of the tensions that is at the heart of this debate. My family business has a financial interest in a salmon farm on Loch Arkeg in Loch Abba. Mr. Finney will know it well. It's a freshwater farm and is a relatively small operation, but it has been there since the 1980s, I believe, and has been a consistent local employer for several decades. It's owned and managed by Marine Harvest, who of course are a major employer across the highlands and islands. And for those, from those who work on site on fish farms to those who process and package the end product, no one can doubt the economic importance of the industry to a fragile area of Scotland. And the Cabinet Secretary is quite right to highlight uh, those points. But I also have an interest in the wild fishery side of life in terms of the Archaig, Spean and Lockie catchment areas. And like many other rivers on the western seaboard, wild salmon and sea trout numbers in those rivers have been in serious and severe decline over the last 20 to 30 years. The reasons for that decline are complex and not fully understood, but undoubtedly the increase in fish farms in the West Highlands uh, has had some detrimental effect on wild fisheries. Yes. John Mason. I, I wonder how the member would respond to the argument that uh, it, the wild fish have been declining since the 1960s, which is actually 50 years since before the, the fish farm started? Donald Cameron. I, I, I don't have any issue with that. I mean, I think there has been, I think we can all agree there has been a, a severe decline over a number of years, whether it's 30 or 50 years. I think, I think that's um, beside the point. The, I think the real issue is that, is that it is incredibly important that, and I think the Cabinet Secretary hinted at this, that a, a piece of work is done uh, outside aquaculture that looks specifically at the decline um, of our wild fishery in general. Um, but stepping away from, from my personal circumstances, I recall one of the first visits I made as an MSP to the Argyll Fisheries Trust in Inverary, where I saw from a map on their wall that a salmon going to sea at the top of Loch Fine required to pass at least 10 fish farms before it reached the open sea. And there was a real sense of the negative effects of those farms on wild fish. But with that as background, let me, um, I'd like to carry on actually. I don't have, don't have long and I've got a lot to cover. Um, with that as background, can I make a few points setting out the position of the Scottish Conservatives uh, in relation to uh, this debate. We are committed to the fish farming industry in Scotland, but recognize that it must operate to the highest environmental standards. That commitment to the highest environmental standards is even more critical if the industry's ambition to double production uh, by 2030 is to be realized. And I am heartened by the more recent constructive approach of the industry, notably bodies like the SSPO and SAIC, who recognize the challenge before it. Turning specifically to the REC report, which is of course the subject of this debate, we welcome its findings. And I, as I said at the start, I observed this process on both committees and appreciate the work, not only of the clerks, but also the many witnesses and the contribution of MSPs. This is a balanced report which I feel takes both a reasonable and measured approach to the challenges facing the salmon industry, but also acknowledges what it has to offer. And as others have spoken about, there is a huge direct, indirect and induced impact of salmon farming, which creates thousands of jobs in Scotland. Figures from 2016 show that Scotland is the largest producer of farmed Atlantic salmon in the EU, uh, with production worth around 765 million pounds. Nevertheless, both the Eclair and REC reports have highlighted significant failings which we on these benches feel need to be addressed in order to strengthen the industry. I feel it's particularly pertinent that the very first recommendation of the REC report says that while the committee acknowledges both the economic and social value 
that the salmon farming industry brings to Scotland. It's essential it addresses and identifies solutions to the environmental and fish health challenges, challenges it faces as a priority. And I think there is an acceptance, a welcome acceptance from the industry that these changes have to happen. The Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation has said the salmon sector supports many of the overall aims and ambitions of this report and seeks to cooperate uh, with the Scottish Government and the regulators to find the best way of ensuring sustainable growth of the industry. Um, new growth, of course, must come with a view to reducing many of the concerns that exist and that the report highlighted. And others have mentioned this, but the current level of mortalities, the REC report says, was too high in general across the sector and is very concerned to, to note the extremely high mortality rates at particular sites. And one in the Highlands and Islands uh, in 2017 was, of course, the one where 125,000 salmon died in Lewis following a bacterial outbreak. Instances like this can be avoided. And I note from the uh, Scottish Salmon uh, Producers Organisation that there has been investment. And for instance, a, a small improvement in salmon mortality rates. So steps are slowly, I think, beginning to achieve something. There's much more to do, and I welcome the extensive series of recommendations on tackling, for instance, sea lice, and the fact that the REC report agreed with the Eclair report that the use of cleaner fish should be explored further. Ensuring we do quickly improve our regulatory approach is vital, but there also needs to be clarity as to who will enforce what. As the report indicates, there were concerns expressed in evidence that none of the regulatory bodies currently has responsibility for the impact of salmon farms on wild salmon stocks. And I, I note also the Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland who felt that there had been a general lack of urgency from the government, uh, and it's clear that, that this must change. But to end where I began, and on a positive note, in Loch Abba, uh, we have collaboration between the local Salmon Fishery Board and Trust and the industry. For example, the industry has invested in a number of wild fish restocking projects. There is collaboration, there's shared scientific and environmental expertise, and I think there's a genuine hope that both sectors can assist each other. So to close, we support the industry. It has to improve. It knows it has to improve. It is in its interest to improve. If it can grow sustainably and operate to the highest environmental standards, the salmon farming industry can continue to play a key role in the Scottish rural economy. Thank you. Rhoda Grant for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, Scottish farmed salmon enjoys an excellent international reputation for quality, and we should never take this for granted. It's important that the industry, um, with exports worth six £600 million pounds, uh, continues to thrive. This is some, something that's lost in the committee report, but it has to be recognised, and I'm glad that Edward Mountain today emphasised that. Therefore, it's all, in all our interests to get salmon farming right in Scotland. To fail would damage the Scottish economy and to put at risk high-quality jobs in remote rural areas. And some of these areas are barely surviving. And the last thing we want to preside over is dying communities. If we're to see the repopulation of rural Scotland, we need to ensure these areas have a thriving economy and fish farming is part of that mix. We need to skill our rural workforce for the jobs in fish farming. We need schools and colleges to get involved in attracting young people to the industry. Young people need to have their horizons broadened. No one says they must all stay within their communities where they were brought up. However, far too often young people are forced away from these remote rural communities because of a lack of career and opportunities. Therefore, when we have an industry that can provide them with that future and career, we need to make sure they know about it and that they have the opportunity to gain the skills that will allow them to work in it. And therefore, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today because we really need to capitalise on the opportunities that fish farming provides. However, that does not mean we accept or condone bad practice. We do not. Both government producers and agencies have to ensure that the reputation is not further damaged in order to allow us to maximise the economic impact of fish farming. We need to aspire to be the best fish farming industry in the world, an industry that is sustainable and has animal welfare at its heart. For many years, the industry have said to me that the bureaucracy that surrounds the industry is huge myriad of organisations, each pulling in different directions. And when I was reading the committee report and indeed the government's response alongside that, that really came home to me. It listed stakeholders and regulatory bodies, the Scottish government, local government, SEPA, 
SNH, the EU, Prince of Wales Sustainab Sustainability Group, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, RSPCA, um, Fish Health Inspectors, Marine Scotland, Crown Estate, and indeed I've got a list of many more, and indeed there is a number that is not on that list. I frankly give up counting them all. We need to streamline the system for regulating planning and managing fish farming. And I wonder if this complexity leads to some of the problems that we've seen, and it certainly doesn't help in the finding of solutions. We need an industry that's well regulated, that meets the highest possible standards. However, in such a cluttered landscape, it's impossible to see how this can be done. And I would urge the government to look at this. I do not think the committee looked in depth at the Norwegian system of management and regulation, but I understand it is much more streamlined and because of that, their industry is much better regulated than ours. Ensuring that fish farming thrives is not just an economic argument, it's also a health issue. We need to eat more oily fish. It's important to our health. We are not eating enough fish. The recommended amount is two servings of fish a day with at least one of, a week, sorry, with at least one of these being oily fish. Obviously, vegetarians and vegans need to find these nutri nutrients elsewhere, but for those of us who do eat fish, we should be following these guidelines. And I listened on the radio to a health specialist uh, recently recommending that people should take supplements of these nutrients. They were clear that this would not be what they would normally recommend when our diet could easily provide what we need, but because there was such a shortage of them in our diet, we needed to look at taking supplements. And farmed salmon is part of that solution because it's rich in long chain omega-3 fatty acids, which are crucial to the fight against heart disease. It's simply not right that people need to rely on supplements when we can produce an abundance of the food that would sco help Scotland fight heart disease. The report also touches, and other speakers have already touched on this as well, the tension between wild and farmed salmon. And these tensions have been long running. And frankly, the science has not reached a conclusion. Wild stocks ebb and flow throughout Scotland tends to happen in the same way both on the west and east coast, despite the fact that there are no fish farms on the east coast. And therefore, it just doesn't simply add up that salmon farming is to blame. And I welcome that further research is being carried out on this because I think it's extremely important. We need to protect wild stocks and we need much more research into what is leading to those changes. Is it climate change or something that is happening further at sea? Both the salmon farming industry and those who fish for wild salmon have an interest in the species, an interest in what helps them thrive and working together to find out more about the species and what is impacting on them is a way forward for both these industries. The report also talks about concerns about escapes but strangely seems to be suggesting that sighting fish farms in rougher water is part of the, 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 the solution to the problems. But rougher water will lead to the risk of more escapes because of higher seas and worse conditions. So if this is the way forward, then we need to ensure that the science and the engineering of cages allows them to withstand these conditions. Our salmon farming industry faces many challenges from those who wish it didn't exist at all. And of course, there are natural disasters, some of which have been alluded to today. Brexit also poses a threat to fish farming as it's been dragged into the backstop. All fish exports will be subject, all fish exports will be subject to export controls and levies, and that could damage the industry. And while I understand that you would want to have a sea fish imports, in the same bargaining space as access to EU, UK waters. However, it makes no sense whatsoever to have this involving farmed fish. We have to get it right for fish farming. There are huge benefits from this industry for health, social and economic. But we don't have to do that by ignoring the threats. We need to face up to them and we need to get our own house in order. John Finney, for up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. If we're quoting lunches, fish cakes, Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure there was a salmon content. They were very tasty, and I commend the canteen for them. Also, uh, commend the 
the parliamentary staff and the witnesses uh, for their assistance in compiling this report and, and the briefings. It's been a very polarised debate. People have often said to me, are you for or against wind farms? And I find that a very peculiar question. They've, they've now moved on to, are you for or against fish farms? And to me, it's like saying you're for or against houses. I like th the right things to be in the right place and in the right way. And uh, I have to say, I, I thought there was a lot of detailed consideration given to this report. And uh, I, I, I was a bit concerned at the criticism that was voiced of the committee that we hadn't given due regard to the industry. I'll therefore read you the very first three lines from the report as the committee acknowledges both economic and social value that the salmon farming industry brings to Scotland. It provides jobs to rural areas, investment um, and spend into communities and stimulates economic activity in the wider supply chain. And we've heard the figures that that's involved. Um, and I think that's, I very much recognise and agree that, that statement, you know, as someone who's from the Highlands and, and indeed uh, may indeed have had a relative working on the farm that Mr Cameron referred to at one point. Um, but I think it's important to also say um, what recommendation one says, the next lines, however, the industry also creates a number of economic, environmental and social challenges for other businesses. Now, among the briefings we've had today is a, a, a copy of a letter that's sent by the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation to uh, the Cabinet Secretary. And uh, I know in the way that he would like to, to be open and transparent about things, it would be good if the reply to that, it may well be that he's not cited on that letter yet, but it raises a number of concerns about what it talks about the expansion of salmon aquaculture. Now, the committee also agreed very strongly with the uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee when it said the status quo is not an option. Um, and it said that was in terms of regulation, uh, the, the regulation enforcement wasn't acceptable and called for uh, urgent and meaningful action. And these were over the things that many members have already talked about. They were sea lice mortality rates and the challenges of close confinement. And recommendation of three, of course, uh, touched on the issue of a moratorium. And, uh, and it formed the view that there was insufficient evidence to support that. Now, in, in a very, very rare break from consensus on the committee, I, I and uh, one of my colleagues, Colin Smith, uh, dissented to that position. Because if you're saying there are all these challenges, if you're saying the status quo uh, is not acceptable, if you're saying you can only expand if you resolve these issues, well, maybe there was a mark reluctance to call it a mor moratorium, but in any effect, that's what it was that we were talking about, and that's most certainly what it should be. Now, this isn't to destroy an industry. Um, we want to get things right. I talked about the level of mortality rate. We have a number of farmers in the, in the, 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 in the chamber here today. They wouldn't tolerance of countenance a fraction of the level of mortality uh, uh, and with their livestock. So there are a number of challenges and uh, I asked and the, the cabinet secretary was very open and said that as far as he was concerned the Scottish government applied the precautionary principle. Well if it has genuinely been applied then why would we not have a moratorium? There's a very, very a good reason why a moratorium wouldn't be as challenging as it sounds. The lead in time for applications to planning and the planning process, I'm told by the industry, is extremely onerous anyway, means that there was the potential for a lot of these issues to be resolved and satisfactorily resolved prior to any granting. Because it's often not the single effect of, of a, a fish farm. I, I spoke to someone in the tourist industry who was unconcerned about a fish farm in the locality. It was a diving industry. They weren't so happy about the uh, second fish farm. The third fish farm and the deposit from them has significantly impacted and this is, do I now buy another boat for this industry? So when we talked about the impact, and I think someone used the term good neighbour, that's precisely what we're talking about. Now, the industry has provided a briefing, and I'm grateful for that, uh, to them for that, and it's a very concise few bullet points, so I'll just quote from some of them. The salmon sector supports many of the overall aims, so it doesn't support all of them. Um, it supports the quicker publication of uh, data, um, the exact time frame and details of this are yet to be worked out, so that's not happened. Um, on seals, and there's been recent coverage of seals, um, they're committed to moving to a situation where no seals are shot by farmers under licence. However, well, I'm sorry, the however is unacceptable, um, and these challenges aren't new to the industry. On sea lice, the salmon sector in Scotland, and for the voice of doubt, this is the Scottish Salmon Producers Association um, organisation's brief. Uh, on sea lice, the salmon sector in Scotland is ready to move to a tighter action level. It's not moved to, and that remains an issue. 
want to establish better relations with the wild farming sector. And we've heard from Mr. Cameron that that is possible. And I think if we're talking about good neighbours, that's being good neighbours and talking with everyone and not having a disproportionate impact on, it, on everyone else. Relocation further offshore. I'm sorry, that's simply rewarding failure. If you don't have something that's working effectively, the idea that you put it out of sight, out of mind, further away, particularly for the challenges of climate change and the challenges of access, that's, that, that's not the way to deal with this. I think there are a number of, of challenges that remain. Um, I certainly not be able to cover the ground in the, the time that's available. The report was compiled in good faith. I hope it's accepted in good faith. That will be established in the long term, not in the short term, by the actions of government. And I have to say, we need more urgency into this debate. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I don't believe that it's there at the moment. There's a lot to go, and we should have a moratorium pending resolution of these issues. Thank you. Mike Rumbles, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we've already heard that farm salmon is Scotland's largest food export and is the third largest farm salmon producer in the world. And it's reliant uh, directly and indirectly from, for more than 10,000 full-time equivalent jobs. And according to the Scot Scottish Salmon Producers Organization, it's worth more than 540 million to the Scottish economy. That in itself is why it's in everyone's interests to ensure that our industry operates to the very highest standards and nothing is done to damage the reputation of our industry. If the reputation of our farmed salmon industry takes a hit, then everyone loses. To be fair, the major producers in the industry recognize this fact, and that's why in their brief to MSPs, their trade body, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organization, supports many of the overall aims and ambitions of our committee report. And I read that quite differently to John Finney. They do support many of our uh, committee recommendations. And I did think that John, John Finney was, a, let's say, a little unkind to them here. I want to highlight what I consider to be the main points of the committee report. In our second recommendation, we say that we agree with the view of the Environment Committee that if the in industry is to grow, the status quo in terms of regulation and enforcement is not acceptable. Now, we've already heard so far in the debate that everybody seems to refer to this quote, but we are referring to it for obvious reasons. It's the key to this issue here. And I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government agrees with that when it says in its response to the committee, if salmon farming is to continue to grow sustainably, then effective procedures need to be in place to address and preempt, where possible, environmental and fish health challenges. And I welcome that. So turning to our recommendation, uh, our 15, I, I will if I have time, uh, and I know I have mentioned you, and I will give you away, away if I have a chance, because so, there's a number of things I want to say. So turning to our 59th recommendation, where we identify a solution to what we see as a lack of effective regulation so far. The committee recommends that Marine Scotland should be tasked with taking responsibility in delivering the necessary improvements and in taking on an overarching coordinating role. Now it was clear in the evidence given to the committee that while there were many different organizations involved in the regulation of this industry, each body took an almost, if I can call it, a silo view of their responsibilities looking after their own aspect of the regulatory process. While it's obvious that each regulatory body needs, of course it does, to do its work, there wasn't any one body taking, an, and I think this is the key to this whole issue, there wasn't one body taking an overview of the whole process that has led to what the committee has described as a, quote, light touch, unquote, regulation and enforcement regime. That approach hasn't actually helped anyone, and it certainly hasn't helped this important industry. In the response from the Scottish Government, it says SEPA, Marine Scotland, our local authorities, and SNH are all currently working in a new group to develop proposals for strengthening protections. Well, that's good, of course it is, but it does seem to me to miss the real point that the committee were making. That is that there needs to be one body with overall responsibility for ensuring that all our regulatory bodies work in a coordinated and effective way and move out of their silos. I will if I have time. John Finney. 
I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you, President. I'm grateful to the member for taking that intervention. What time frame would the member allow that single body to resolve these issues which uh, are in play? Mike Rumbles. Well, that's a very interesting question, and I wish I knew the answer to that, because I'm not going to be prescriptive here. I think that's the job of uh, Fergus Ewing, him sitting in front of us. It's a, it's a very important, responsible task that he has, and I'm prepared to listen to what he says. So I, I hope that um, the minister would answer that question. Turning to the issue of planning applications for fish farms, the committee believes that a more strategic approach is needed here too. Strategy is what's coming out of this. It seems to be missing. Whether the Scottish Government should develop guidance to local authorities as to what areas across Scotland are suitable for new fish farms and those areas which are not. So that instead of local authorities making a judgment on a specific application that they receive in a specific time for a specific place, that's what the law requires them to do, to look at that specific application. They should be able to take a strategic view of the application in the round, and that's really important. So while I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government in its response says that it will meet with the local authorities to discuss a more strategic approach to sustainable agriculture across their areas of accountability, it is actually guidance that is needed here official guidance from the Scottish Government. Now, the, in conclusion, the committee has worked well together across party political divides to produce the report, and I think that's really important. I do hope that the Scottish Government has got the message here that about robust and effective regulation, regulation that's coordinated to ensure that the very highest standards underpin this hugely important industry for us here in Scotland. We all want this industry to continue to succeed. The way to ensure success is to maintain the very highest standards of fish health and environmental protection. That is what will underpin consumer confidence, and it's that consumer confidence that will secure the success of this important industry. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. We're a bit pushed for time, so speeches of strictly up to five minutes, please. John Mason, followed by Finlay Carson. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Five minutes, I think I heard you say. Um, we certainly worked long and hard on this report. Having finished uh, taking the evidence uh, last June, the committee only got to working on the report after the summer recess, and that took quite a number of weeks, including, it has to be said, delays, as the convener has referred to, as we discussed leaks uh, along the way. Now, I think it's public knowledge that I clashed somewhat with the convener as to how these leaks were dealt with, but I certainly would agree with him that uh, such leaks are not really acceptable. So perhaps it was not surprising that during that long period while we considered the report, the ground shifted with SEPA announcing their new thinking for the way forward, and that in turn meant we had to further amend our report. However, here we are, and I think we can say we agreed on the bulk of the issues. Yes, salmon farming is a huge export and provides jobs in fragile areas and has other economic and wider benefits. But yes, too, we agreed that there are problems with lice, pollution, and what the impact on wild fish and other wildlife might be. If we disagreed, it was more on the respective scale of these benefits and disadvantages. The key disagreement was on whether there should be a moratorium, as John Finney has been referring to, on new developments until regulations improve, or whether we improve the regulation and allow the industry to expand and the two can go hand in hand. And this, I think, is where my esteemed colleague, uh, John Finney, and some of the rest of us uh, disagreed somewhat. The majority of the committee were not convinced that there should be a moratorium on expansion. Having said that, unsurprisingly, we spent a lot of time focused on problems rather than all the good things that are going fine. And I think that's uh, human nature and applies in politics, football, and most areas of life. Clearly, public trust in any food product is important, and that is why we need to be particularly protective of our environment, our food production methods and our regulation. We need only think back to the BSE crisis to remember that it was not only the reputation of beef which was damaged at that time, but it did reflect on the whole Scottish brand. And trust is something that we can take a long time to recover once an individual, a product or a country has lost it. That is why we need to be particularly careful of our environment and perhaps be more wary of taking risks even if other countries do so. Fracking is just another example where our food exports could be damaged just by the impression that we are lax on environmental standards. 
And that's why I think the recommendations we made around transparency are so important. Uh, 11, 12, 13, 19 to 25, 31 and 33 all touch on that area of transparency. It's also featured in our recommendations on wild and farmed fish interactions uh, in recommendation 39. The reality is that we were repeatedly told that there was a lack of data on many issues around this subject. On the one hand, strong claims were made that farmed fish were damaging wild stocks, yet we also heard that wild fish numbers were falling before farms were introduced, and some rivers on the east coast have fewer wild fish despite the fact they have no salmon farms. And it does seem that salmon are not as keen as ospreys and golden eagles to be carrying around tracking devices so we know where they are and what they do. The level of feeling on this question of interaction became apparent to the committee as emails flooded in containing claims and counterclaims. The committee was subjected to repeated FOI requests as one side sought to find out what the other was doing. And even before today's debate, there have been yet more emails and more briefings. So it was refreshing to visit Loch Aber and to see a better relationship and at least some attempt by both sides to work together and understand each other. I think there was broad agreement from witnesses that a precautionary approach be taken on location of farms and other areas of planning and regulation. However, there was not agreement on whether such an approach is in fact being taken place at present. Some argued that the industry and government are, are being cautious, while other argued, others argued that they are not but need to be. But I wanted finally to spend a bit of time concentrating on the positive effects of salmon farming. This is a sector in which Scotland is a world leader. Ourselves and Norway are seen as two of the leading countries and Scottish salmon fetches a premium price on world markets. I do agree everything's not perfect and we should not be complacent, but let us not go down to the other extreme and run ourselves down. We have a fabulous product in a fabulous environment. Yes, we can improve and develop each of these. Yes, we can learn from others, but let us be proud of both our environment and our product. As Gillian Martin said, salmon used to be a food in Glasgow uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't say this, but uh, salmon used to be a food in Glasgow that was so common and so readily available that employers were restricted in how much they could feed it to their workers. But times changed, and I grew up, like Gillian Martin, uh, thinking of salmon as a luxury product, which we would not see on the family table. Now things have changed again. Scottish salmon appears to be in most of our supermarkets, and I eat it on a regular basis. It is widely seen as one of our healthiest foods, and I hope other members too will support the industry by buying and eating Scottish salmon. Thank you. Finlay Carson, followed by Richard Lyle. Can I remind everyone up to five minutes, please? Deputy Presiding Officer, I believe this debate marks an important mil milestone in the future of salmon farming in Scotland. While the debate is centred on the, the Rex inquiry into salmon farming, much of the report highlights the work carried out by the Clare and its own report into the environmental impact of salmon farming. Fish farming is the fastest growing form of animal food production on the planet, with around half of fish consumed globally raised in artificial environments. The importance of aquaculture to the Scottish rural economy cannot be understated. The industry being a mainstay of many rural economies, particularly along the west and northwest coast of Scotland, supporting over 12,000 jobs, the supply chain companies and boosting, uh, boosting exports for Scotland and the UK. The 2016 Scottish Government strategy predicts an increase in salmon production to about 350,000 tonnes per year, potentially worth in the region of 3.6 billion by 2030. This industry has huge potential to expand in the future. However, this industry, above all else, depends on the health of the environment in which it operates. It's clear that whether the sector expands or not, in regards to its impact on the environment and the marine environment, the status quo, as we've heard, is not an option. This report clearly indicates expansion that will only be possible with more effective regulatory standards, which both ensure that fish health issues are properly managed and the impacts on our environment are minimised to absolutely ensure an economically and an environmentally sustainable industry. One reason this inquiry was undertaken was the growing body of evidence of the negative environmental impacts, despite aquaculture in Scotland itself investing heavily in innovation to solve environmental and fish health challenges. The Eclair Committee highlighted that the same issues 
that existed around environment impact uh, in 22 still exists now with concerns around high rates of sea lice, outbreaks of disease and escapes. Indeed, some of those issues have grown in scale and impact since 2002. The Eclair Committee concluded that we are at a critical point in considering how salmon farming develops in a sustainable way in relation to the environment, highlighting concerns that expansion is being developed without a full understanding of the impact. With that in mind, I agree that an independent assessment of the environmental sustainability is necessary. However, I do welcome that the committee concluded that there was insufficient evidence for introducing a moratorium on further expansion. A moratorium, I believe, would have been devastating for the industry, which we must look to grow, albeit with the right safeguards in place. I'm pleased that the Eclair's recommendations were taken forward in relation to wild salmon populations, in particular the interactions between farmed and wild salmon. Though this might be difficult to deliver in practice, the sharing of data must be encouraged across the sector in order to ensure best practice across industry. Unfortunately, there's little time to consider all of the report, so I thought I would look at, uh, in particular, the challenge of sea lice infestation. The clear position is that a precautionary approach must be taken to address any potential impact of sea lice uh, from salmon farms on our iconic wild salmon population. I must add that the sea lice are only one of many factors affecting the wild salmon population, and I do look forward to my committee doing further work to explore the fallen numbers in our rivers. It is important to note that sea lice numbers recorded at salmon farms were at their lowest in number in September 2018 since reporting began. Without question, the industry has invested considerably in an attempt to address sea lice, and sea lice infestation on both farmed fish health and on wild salmon uh, populations. However, it's clear the industry has yet to identify a means to effectively deal with this parasite. With growing concern about the use of emerectin, benzoate and other anti-parasitic chemical treatments, which CEPA research concluded is significantly impacting local environment, uh, marine environments. Recommendation 26 endorses the Clare's recommendations on the use of cleaner fish species such as RAS, but with urgent need to assessments of future demand, given the growing concern that the current unregulated fishery is wiping local stocks out completely. Inshore fisheries and conservation authorities in England have brought in statutory regulations for the RAS fishery, uh, and I wonder if the Minister would consider replicating the best practice uh, in Scottish waters. The industry talks about a shift to farmed cleaner fish, but the most recent data shows production of just 58,000 ras when projection, uh, pro projections show that we'd need about 10 million by 2020. If the wild fishery collapse, collapses and farming cannot fill the gap, what is the future uh, for alternatives to chemical lice control? With additional safeguards recommended by the committee, coupled with Scotland's you eminable close, history of innovation, I am confident that the salmon farming industry can continue to grow, while at the same time taking into account the needs of our natural environment. Richard Lyle, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, it gives me great pleasure to take part in today's debate. I want to begin my contribution this afternoon by stating clearly that I support salmon farming in Scotland because of its potential growth. It is, in my opinion, sustainable and its contribution to our local communities. It is a Scottish industry that I want to see continue to grow and prosper. Salmon farming will bring increased benefits to Scotland, the local community and the local economy. The growth of the Scottish uh, salmon farming industry started in the 1970s. According to Highland, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, it's come to be dominated by operators who have companies operating in several countries, which includes many productions and job opportunities in Scotland. Aside from jo job growth, it also provides 17.5 billion meals each year worldwide. This speaks volumes to the success as it is a leader to the salmon industry, along with Norway, Canada and Chile. Scotland's salmon is quality superior. We have come a long way since the start of this industry, and I want to see it expand to be a global leader in their, in their respective production. Yes, it must expand, but also it must tackle the problems along the way. That has been a good food provider. To become a European and a world leader in the production of salmon, the industry has declared its ambition to double the value of salmon by 2030. 
Furthermore, the salmon industry is currently spending around £400 million each year in Scotland on goods and services. As this industry continues to grow and reinvest, there is clearly an opportunity for Scottish-based businesses, an opportunity not to be missed. As a result, I am fully supportive of this industry because it aligns itself with our values. The sustainability report documented that salmon is a sustainable uh, source of uh, protein. It leaves less carbon footprint when it is compared to chicken, pork and beef. Did not you know that? Chicken, pork and beef are still, still produces 20 times more than salmon, but the salmon farmer in Scotland can contribute to reducing this statistic as it has the support, I believe it has the support of all present today. I am proud, therefore, that we will continue to support an industry that enriches the lives of the people of Scotland. After the two reports by committees, I would now suggest that protecting the environment is one of the top priorities of this industry. SEPA reported that more than 87% of the farms that produce salmon were either categorised as good, as good or excellent. Salmon farming should be rightly committed to protecting the health and well-being of marine life, with the advancement of technology, they should be improving new ways of how to minimise factors that could result in any damage to the seabed. Technology has reached new heights. It should be used, therefore, by firms to resolve any local issues. But I'm not here only to talk about what we can accomplish or have accomplished. I'm here today to present to you with the things that we have successfully ex executed. executed. Presiding officer, what this industry has done for our country and what it can do in the future will reflect the best of Scotland. This industry plays a vital role in enhancing the lives of our communities, creates job opportunities for the people of Scotland, with salaries that tend to be higher when compared with the Scottish average. Not only does it directly support our local employment, it also aids indirect jobs across the supply chain within the industry. This industry is clearly vital to the growth of Scotland and must be supported as it continues to grow. The ambition of this industry is well summarised with what they have done, what they are going to do, what they are committed to do for Scotland, and I would encourage them to do so. I would like to underline a key element in the industry, social economic impact. Salmon farming directly employs 1,772 people across freshwater and seawater farms. Agriculture contributes enormously to the rural economy by supporting work 12,000 jobs. Over a million salmon meals are consumed in the UK every day, including the Cabinet Secretary today. Over 60 countries with overseas sales worth £600 million, making Scottish farm salmon the UK's most valuable export. Many of these jobs will help su support, sustain rural economies. Uh, that also helps to keep rural schools, post offices, shops and community halls open. As I have uh, already outlined, presiding officer, I could go on and on and on, but you tell me I can't. So my support for the salmon in industry is now on record, and I wish them well. Thank you. Claudia Beamish, followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sustainable development must be at the core of the way forward for all activity in our precious marine environment. This underpins our national marine plan. And this is essential for the future of all those who work in the salmon farming industry. In our Eclair Committee letter to the REC Committee, we stated, Scotland is at a critical point in considering how salmon farming develops in a sustainable way in relation to the environment. If the current issues are not addressed, this expansion will be unsustainable and may cause irrecoverable damage to the environment. In view of the range of evidence from our scientific report, and some of which has come to light since uh, that part of our letter, I today uh, emphasise that I would change the word may to will, and in my short time uh, to speak, I'm going to delineate and try to distill some of the reasons why. In the last session of this Parliament, I had the responsibility for scrutinising and making contributions to the Agriculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2013. The purpose of the Act was to ensure fisheries are managed to support sustainable economic growth with due regard to the wider marine environment. I will start with sea lice and a continuing serious animal welfare issue, which also risks denting consumer confidence if it is not properly tackled. The, the, REC commit, sorry, the Rural Affairs, um, Environment and Climate Change Committee, in our scrutiny of the Act, had to ask stakeholders to stop sending evidence about sea lice because it had, in our judgment, become a tit for tat. This time, we were a little wiser, and the Eclair Committee started with the commissioning of a peer-reviewed scientific report. 
Back then in 2013, I tabled an amendment calling for farm-by-farm -farm sea lice reporting in real time. This was rejected by the Scottish Government and by the industry uh, body, the SSPO, the latter principally on commercial confidentiality grounds. It is thus extraordinary to me to hear last year that the SSPO uh, waited until giving evidence to our committee to make the announcements that the measures the body had agreed uh, to tackle on this issue. It just doesn't wash. I now note that the Cabinet Secretary's reviewed farm sea, farm sea lice compliance policy will include consideration of mandatory reporting. However, consideration can be a disappointing word, and I would seek reassurance from the Cabinet Secretary without preempting the, the group in his closing remarks. When I visited uh, a marine harvest fish farm during the scrutiny of the Aquaculture Act, the wonders of RAS as a cleaner fish for sea lice were extolled. And it is now, there are serious questions to answer, as we've heard from Finlay Carson as well, and also by the SIFT briefing, as to the sustainability of the wild stocks. Can it be acceptable for the aquaculture industry to be self-regulating the RAS fishery through voluntary measures? The industry still has a lot to do to prove its sustainable development credentials, and I very much hope it will do this. I, along with Colin Smith, will be attending the opening of the salmon fishing season on the NITH with the NITH uh, District Salmon Fishery Board. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, also update the Chamber today on the timelines for the Salmon Interactions Working Group? It is fundamentally important both for salmon and for sea trout, and this also contributes to the fragile communities which depend on, in part on rod fishing tourism. And this is also about local people fishing. The, the Fisheries Management Scotland points out that both committees recommended urgent research into the development of closed containment uh, facilities, and I hope this will be taken on board by the Cabinet Secretary. And can he also update the Chamber today on the timescales for reporting uh, for the welcome subgroups of the Strategic far um, uh, Farmed Salmon f uh, Health uh, Framework Working Group? Thank you. Um, the status quo, as we have heard many times today, and from both committees, is not an option. I think we all get that now in this chamber, in the industry and in the agencies. The sustainable future of the industry must be a collective effort. Further research is essential, and this must be in part funded by the industry itself. But however, how can this be independent? Possibly by, in part by a charging regime which enables groups representing the industry, local authorities, community and concern groups and regulatory bodies to commission independent research into fish welfare and mortality, into the appropriate sightings uh, of uh, future applications, the effects of medicines on the seabed, to name but some of the issues we have to get right. And I welcome the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre which will have a strong role to play and their briefing. The provenance of our farmed salmon, its reputation, affordable food here and for export, and the maintaining and developing of work in our fragile coastal communities are all at stake. And I hope the Scottish Government today will commit to the precautionary principle unequivocally in going forward. Thank you. Mark Russell, followed by Tavi Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I first thank members of the REC Committee for their detailed work on this report. And I'm very pleased to hear from the convener that the early work that we did in the Eclair Committee really helped to focus in on the environmental issues. I think that's how this, this Parliament should be working more collaboratively. Now, both committees have recognised that the status quo is unacceptable and that fundamental change is needed. And I think in many ways this report marks a crossroads, a crossroads in the way that we regulate the salmon farming industry in Scotland. Because in one direction, we can continue with weak regulation and an industry growing well beyond the limits of the environment that sustains it. But in the other direction, we can drive high quality through regulation that demands that industry innovates to address problems before it can expand any further. Now, you could call that direction a moratorium, but I believe it's a way of delivering future growth and jobs in communities while addressing the problems head on. Now, last year I attended the Arctic Circle um, Forum in, in Reykjavik with um, the Clare convener, Gillian Martin, and um, I heard from those who are planning the future of the global salmon farming industry. Uh, and it was a, an eye-opener because it was clear that while we're not alone in Scotland in highlighting the problems, I believe that we are slipping behind in delivering the solutions by failing to adopt more Nordic approaches to regulation and licensing. Now, the Norwegians in particular have recognized that they've reached a peak 
The footprint of the industry in the fjords has got far too big. But instead of seeking sticking plaster solutions, they've driven transformative innovation through competitive licensing. Now, this is a profitable industry. The market price of farmed salmon has nearly trebled in the last 20 years. And the coastlines to rear salmon are globally scarce. And listed companies are keen to show stock markets that they have a strong future. So there can be no leakage of salmon farming to other countries because every country faces similar problems. Limitless capacity doesn't exist. And the only way to survive is to innovate harder and to innovate faster. So the Norwegians have allowed companies to expand further but only if they invest in that innovation. And companies have come forward with an incredible array of closed or semi-closed systems based in the sea that address the issues of disease, parasitism, fish escapes, and pollution from waste and chemicals head on. Now, many of these solutions are offshore, and they borrow technology from the oil and gas industry. Sites for new and expanded farms are, are auctioned off to the highest bidder. And last year's licensing round in Norway generated over 300 million euros from just 23 auction sites, releasing a combined production capacity increase of around 15,000 tons. So the auctioning of these sites at high value creates the wealth that can then be reinvested back into the research. Now, I recently visited the um, Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Center at Stirling University, already mentioned by a, a number of members, and there's excellent work there. Uh, going on that's focused on understanding and managing the problems associated with open cage salmon farming. But that work would be truly transformative if it was applied to the kind of sea-based closed systems that are already being developed in Norway. So why does Scotland remain a dumping ground for old open pen technology that Norwegian companies would not get away with using on new sites at home? Meanwhile, the search for solutions to old problems is getting ever more desperate. For example, why are we compounding salmon farming's destructive impact by allowing an unregulated wrasse fishery that could drive species to extinction, all to solve a parasite problem that could be largely avoided by using contained systems? The wrasse fishery has no reliable stock monitoring, no statutory closure to allow recovery during the breeding season, and poor regulation of landing sizes. The government, as other members have said already, has effectively signed over control of this fishery to the salmon farming industry, and so doing is failing in its statutory duties under the Nature Conservation Act. Without these safeguards, there is a clear case for a catching moratorium until the regulation has caught up. So once again, we're trapped in a calamity where industry tries to externalize all its damages onto the public purse, while we're left studying the impacts and scratching our heads about how to deal with them. Meanwhile, the industry is more than capable of, capable of innovating out of the problems if only it had the right incentives. So, presiding officer, this is the, cross, the crossroads that we're now at. SEPA's aquaculture sector review currently falls woefully short of the kind of transformative regulation that we're beginning to see in Norway. SEPA's conclusions for this review need to come back to this parliament for both committees to scrutinize. We can't strike a, a, a cheap compromise between the environment and the economy when it comes to salmon farming, because we actually need both. And the prize is there if the government can actually start thinking in a more Norwegian manner. Tavish Scott, followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, Dennis and Katrine Johnson, uh, office window in Uwe Sound in Unst, uh, looks out over uh, a pristine marine uh, landscape. Uh, and they wouldn't recognise, uh, as they have been in, working in this industry for many years, they wouldn't recognise much of, or some things that have been said in, t said in this debate today. They certainly wouldn't recognise that uh, last speech and the allegations of de deliberate malpractice about people who've worked in the marine environment uh, all their uh, lives for a variety of different companies. I mean, salmon farming, uh, it, uh, a lot of people don't seem to have any history on this. Salmon farming started as a small crofting business from, in lots of parts of Scotland, including on the West Coast, and is now owned uh, largely by international uh, companies. It's changed overwhelmingly. But what's not changed is a number of people who are employed in, in parts of Scotland that simply wouldn't have jobs if salmon farming didn't exist. And Unst and Yale, Fettler are the best example of that that I uh, know anywhere in Scotland. 110 direct jobs and any number of 100 indirect uh, jobs. Those jobs just wouldn't exist. Those islands would not exist were, were not for that industry. So the idea 
uh, that these people deliberately pollute and deliberately, uh, uh, deliberately go around um, with the issues of sea life, mortality, and all the rest, and try to do nothing about it uh, are, are lines of uh, argument that I just don't recognise in people. No, we've heard from you. We've absolutely heard the Green position, and by gosh, was it clear. And that speech, I can assure you, that speech will go to every one of my constituents so they know, uh, they know where, uh, where you are. <laughs> Uh, can I remind members that you speak through the chair and not to each other, please? Well, presiding officer, 110 jobs directly in the North Isles of Shetland, 23% of Scottish production of uh, farm salmon grown in Shetland, 421 people in, my, uh, in the islands I represent worth £14 million to the local economy, uh, never mentioned by those kind of speeches uh, from those benches uh, over there. And the other side to this report that I found puzzling, the Minister rightly mentioned the food and drink strategy. No mention of that in this committee report. This is a... This there would not be a food and drink strategy in Scotland without the salmon farming industry and its export, as the Minister rightly said, to uh, 50, uh, to 50 uh, countries. Nor would there be the range of people who now re uh, work in the industry. As Ben Hadfield said in evidence for marine harvest to the industry, uh, we used to employ just a farm manager and some farm hands. Now we employ scientists, uh, veterinarians, people with information technology skills, and so on and so forth. And Scottish Sea Farms, in their submission to uh, uh, members before this debate, pointed out that on uh, fish welfare, a point not made by too many other members in this uh, debate, 36 farm-based fish health specialists, three in-house vets, two fish welfare auditors, two fish welfare officers at every harvest, and one head of fish health. A huge number of incredibly uh, able people. No, I'm going to make these arguments, Mr Finney. Um, uh, and you didn't, so I'm going to make them. Uh, these, 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 uh, Mr uh, Finney, please sit down. Uh, the men and women with degrees and huge numbers of very precise qualifications now working in this industry uh, all over Scotland. And I think that's something we should champion and support, uh, not run down, as some people have chosen uh, to do uh, today. Uh, the, second, the, the other fi the point I want to make about innovation, uh, can I just make these points about innovation and investment? Uh, we've, we've heard uh, Claudia Beamish's take on these issues already. Um, uh, uh, on Scottish Sea Farms alone, they are trialling an innovative new device to convert wave energy to power, a green measure I would have thought that would be worth mentioning by some in this place. The Mantra converter has been introduced on a farm in Shetland. It's hoped that that converter will produce enough, enough electricity to power feeding systems, underwater lighting, and acoustic predator deterrence, thus reducing the company's reliance on diesel and indeed doing something about the predator issue uh, as well. And in Shetland alone, uh, we do not expect to need to have any uh, licenses for seals uh, this year at all because of the work the industry is doing, because of the work the industry is investing in. I wish a few more members had mentioned that uh, uh, as, as, as well. Uh, so the seems to me uh, lots of uh, uh, matters that are being invested that have not been uh, have not come up in this debate and what has what was mentioned by a number of mentions, members and rightly so is the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation uh, Centre doing very strong work in conjunction with the industry and they point out in their briefing for this uh, debate that uh, in the first phase of funding they have turned the four, a 5.4 million pound project spend into a total R&D investment programme of 39 million pounds across Scotland of which 40 million has come direct from industry contributions. It seems to me the industry investing uh, in exactly the kind of measures that are needed in terms of the environment, in terms uh, of uh, the future, which are desperately needed as well. Because it's not just about the industry uh, directly, it's the indirect jobs that go with that. It is the well boats, it is the uh, haulage companies, if you, if you drive along the uh, M6, if you happen to look out on the right-hand side as you're going past Lark Hall, you will see a bunch uh, of uh, logistics centres, all of which employ people in uh, many constituencies in the central belt of Scotland, Deputy Presiding Officer, who work supporting the salmon farming industry. It's not just about uh, rural areas of this country, it is about right across uh, the whole of uh, Scotland. Uh, and on sea lice, uh, maybe this was the point Claudia Beamish you wanted to make, the Scottish to sea farms close, uh, are investing in sea lice shield, that is 13 farms already and growing, who will actually have a measure to deal with exactly the issue that I recognise uh, needs to be invested. Let me finish just by making one observation. The presiding, no, the, very quickly, Mr well, Scott. I was going to say that Mr Ewing and I, and I have been in this chamber a long time, and this industry has been attacked by uh, big landed interests with uh, fishing rivers and the Greens for many years. I hope he stands up to it for a few more years. Maureen Watt, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In taking this part in this debate, I should point out that I joined the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee after it had taken all its evidence on the salmon industry. So therefore, I had to start by reading the Eclair Committee's report, all the written evidence, and the committee reports where they had taken over, uh, uh, oral evidence. 
uh, in order for me to contribute to the report it was, as it was being written up. In my view, it is important that the REC committee looked at the industry and framed its report on the basis of the rural economy and its importance to it and not have an Environment Committee Mark II report. In 2017, as others have said, the salmon farming industry harvested 189,000 tonnes and the sector's highest ever output. Exports reached an all-time high in 2017 of £600 million worth of exports, going to 50 countries worldwide, with the US, France and China at the top three countries. Interestingly, salmon sales to the EU account for 40% of export value. As the Cabinet Secretary said, according to the HIE employment in the industry and its wider supply chain, topped 10,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Earnings, direct and indirect, are valued at around 271 million. As Tavish Scott, well-paid jobs with good promotional prospects. Salmon farming has a GVA for Scotland of 540 million. Salmon farming companies spent 164 million on suppliers and services in the Highlands and Islands alone in 2016. So, presiding officer, the importance of this relatively new industry to rural and remote communities and their sustainability cannot be understated. The industry's importance to other parts of Scotland should also be recognised, for example, in Rosyth, in Bells Hill and in Stirling, as others have mentioned, with the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre. And I too recognised the huge amount, almost half, to the innovation and research and development that is provided by the industry itself. Presiding officer, this industry has also transformed, as Gillian Martin said, our population's access to healthy, uh, to a healthy, food, healthy source of food and protein. It's now an affordable source of food on our school dinner menus and in our supermarkets. But in terms of the supermarkets, the sector is only as strong as its weakest, weakest link which is why, in my view, everyone connected with the industry and, in the words of Heather Jones, Chief Executive of SAIC, the industry agrees it needs to be stable, well-regulated, animal-friendly and scientifically robust. And that is why she said that this is why we welcome the report's publication and focus on how aquaculture can deliver benefits to the Scottish economy and local communities. I haven't come across anyone in the industry who doesn't believe that the industry should continue to grow in anything other than a sustainable way. The industry recognised the problems of mortalities, gill disease and sea lice and is already taking action to address these issues. It's not in the industry's interest, whether it be its markets or its profitability, not to deal with these issues. We know the highly competitive nature of the business and the hugely competitive industries that there are in Norway, Chile and Canada. So with my time remaining, presiding officer, I would like to address the role of the regulatory bodies, particularly SEPA, in improving the industry as we go forward. Members will know that on the 7th of November, SEPA published its draft Thin Fish Aquaculture Sector Plan Indeed, SEPA held a drop-in event in Parliament allowing members to discuss this and they have already consulted widely um, across the sector, NGOs and partner public bodies. About, I think I calculated, 14 of our Salmon Report's recommendations are directed at SEPA <clears throat> and in their briefing to us they go through them and how they are addressing those. So um, a recommendation, a true ad addresses regulatory deficiencies as well as fish health and environmental issues. And that's why they believe their fish aquaculture sector plan already uh, deals with this. Uh, other recommendations in terms of medicines are addressed in terms of those, uh, in terms of medicines, the UK Technical Advisory Committee of which SEPA is a member is dealing with that and other uh, recommendations 40, 41 and 42 relating to the protection of wild salmon uh, are also addressed by the Interactions Working Group. 
I think it is important that the regimes are co coordinated, enhance, robust and effectively enforce uh, compliance with high en environmental standards. So in conclusion, presiding officer, um, in meeting all these recommendations in the reports, I'm sure everyone is engaged to in con continuous improvement in the, in the industry. And as legislators, we must be enhancing this exciting industry. Thank you very much. And I call Jamie Green to be followed by Alex Rodley. Uh, presiding officer, can you imagine a farm anywhere in Scotland uh, where the animals are covered in flesh-eating parasites, diseased, and where a third of its livestock dies before even reaching market. A farm such as this would surely be the subject of many questions by us, by its peers, by the media, and feel the full weight of our regulatory regimes. A farm such as this makes no environmental sense, makes no moral sense, nor any commercial sense, even to the farmer itself. Why then is a farm in water any different from one on land? Well, one is an established form of practice, which we have been doing for hundreds, arguably thousands of years. And the other is a fledgling industry which has seen monumental growth in demand for its product in a relatively short lifespan. And this is the conundrum that I personally face from day one of this salmon farming inquiry. How do we strike that balance between supporting what is undoubtedly and undeniably a proud Scottish industry of great importance to our economy but equally be bold enough to say that the status quo is simply not good enough. We spent months taking evidence, often in the face of hyperbolic and often apocalyptic headlines, with emotions running high on all sides of the debate, as today shows. From day one, you were expected to assume one side of the argument over another. Are you in favour of fish farms or against? Do you favour a moratorium or are you against? Are fish farms the reasons for stock reductions in wild salmon or not. And it was against that backdrop that it seemed like an impossible task. The, rural, the, the role of the Rural Economies Report was partially but not exclusively the environmental aspects of salmon. We also had a duty to consider the social, financial, employment and the export aspects of the industry. Recommendation one set the scene. It said that if the industry is to grow, to grow uh, it must identify solutions to the challenges it faces. Recommendation, recommendation two went on to say, if the industry is to grow, then meaningful ac action needs to be taken to address regulatory deficiencies. And what is the difference between those recommendations? The first shines a light on the need for the industry to tackle its own problems. And the second says that it is the re regulatory environment in which it operates that we also need to sort out. Both are necessary, in my view. I think the 2030 vision of growing the industry is an admirable one. And we as a parliament should be positive about it. The industry supports up to 10,000 jobs in Scotland and nearly two billion pounds to our economy. A lot has been achieved and I too want it to grow. But presiding officer, growth cannot and must not come at any cost. I have not met anyone over our deliberations uh, who is blind to or ignorant to the massive challenges that this industry faces. But I too have stood in the cold waters of Scottish rivers, none of them my own, rod in hand with nothing to catch but the cold. I believe that if we get some salmon farming right and with the right partnerships in place, we should and could work collectively to get to a place where we're proud of our product and where the industry can grow in the knowledge that it can do so in a responsible and regulated manner. Let me share some further, further thoughts on this. First, one of the recurrent themes that's come out of this report and today is that around the regulatory framework that I think is meeting neither the needs of producers nor those with serious concerns about the industry. A robust and forcible approach to regulation is the only thing that will be acceptable to address the concerns of many who have concerns over animal welfare and the environmental effects of this rapid growth that we've seen. Secondly, the same goes for the planning and consent process. It relies on subjective interpretation of what is in the public good. And thirdly, grow the industry, but do not grow for growing sake. And I think salmon producers themselves accept that. We have to compete with Chile, with Norway and Canada, but this is not a race to the bottom. Farmed Scottish salmon should enjoy the highest quality standards. Let us be world leading 
in every respect. And lastly and more importantly is the siting of fish farms. My personal view is that we should give serious consideration to the following, to close containment sites or onshore sites, to the moving of sites which are in sensitive areas and the potential closure of sites where everyone agrees that mortality levels are unsustainable or those who are repeat offenders. Let's have an informed and sensible debate about offshore farms as well. It's not the great panacea that some believe. And I think we should give serious consideration to the traffic light system that exists in Norway, which will allow different bits of Scotland to do what is right for their region and their environment. There's so much more I wish we had time to cover in the short debate, and this debate is certainly not over. I do support the growth of the Scottish salmon industry, but let the message also be heard today. We are watching and we will act. Thank you very much. And I call Alex Rowley to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. President Officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate today on the conclusion of the report on salmon farming in Scotland by the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I have a particular interest in this report as I sat on the Environment Committee when its inquiry went on into the environmental impacts of salmon farming in Scotland. While listening to the evidence and reading up on the issues, I found myself shocked by some of the concerns that were being raised. As someone who ate salmon on a very regular basis, I have to say the levels of disease, mortality, and the use of harmful chemicals used in the treatment of disease has certainly left me very concerned. Given that farmed Atlantic salmon is Scotland's and the UK's largest food export, and that Scotland is the largest producer in the whole of the EU, I think that addressing the failings in the industry should be an absolute priority. That is not to be negative about the industry. Surely that is common sense if we want the industry to grow. In truth, this is an industry that has shown it cannot self-regulate and is why we need and must demand much stronger regulation and action from the Scottish Government. The report we are debating today makes that point when it says, and I quote, the same set of concerns regarding the environmental impact of salmon farming exists now as in 2002, but the scale and impact of these has expanded since 2002. There has been a lack of progress in tackling many of the key issues previously identified and unacceptable levels of mortality persist. It is clear that something is not right if the problems in the industry are still present nearly 20 years later and, in fact, are getting worse. That is why I think it is incredibly important that the Scottish Government take note of the recommendations of this report today and the recommendations from the Environmental Committee as well, both of which highlight a desperate need for urgency in tackling the problems of intensive farming, sea lice, disease and escapes from farmed fish. These problems mean questions need to be raised around the issue of transparency and the publication of data, which is raised by both committee reports. By making data around mortalities, sea lice, disease and escapes more transparent, we will be able to get a much clearer picture of what is actually going on in this industry. The public have a right to know what chemicals are being used in these farms and the impact of those chemicals in locks across Scotland as well as in our food. The committee report also highlights action that can be taken now to address and alleviate these problems. The Scottish Government could commit to the development and introduction of full closed containment contaminated farming. I recognise this would need further research, but by outlining a realistic target for this, the Scottish Government would be taking a bold step and showing a commitment to addressing the negative effects of salmon farming on wild stocks. The questions around the pace of growth in the salmon industry remain with real, very real concerns that the industry must get its act together before any major expansion takes place. 
This again would show commitment to tackling the issues so that in another 20 years, we are not simply talking about the problems that exist now. With regard to the concerns raised about the impact of salmon farms on wild stock, it is clear that the Scottish Government has not understood and appreciated the urgency of the situation in merely talking about a mechanism to inform the longer term determination of a regulatory framework in this area and a staged approach to building a long term set of arrangements to fill the current regulatory gap. Indeed, these are not my words, but the words of the Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland. They are very clear that the Scottish Government response shows a general lack of urgency in key areas. And what is required is urgent action and enforcement to control the negative impacts of the salmon farming industry. There is an opportunity for the Scottish Government to show leadership by taking on board the recommendations of both the committee reports. Um, MSPs, the Salmon and Trout and, uh, Conservation Scotland state, MSPs should be suspicious of announcements of further working groups on fish health or further repeat reviews of existing licensing and permitting designed to kick the committee's concerns into the long grass. We have been there before. The time is now for action, not words. I do hope the Scottish Government will realise the seriousness of this situation and take the action that is necessary. Thank you, and I call Stuart Stevenson before we move to closing speeches. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me start by uh, thanking Tavish Scott's uh, constituents for the excellent products they produce in their uh, salmon farms and indeed all round Scotland. Uh, this supports industries in my constituency. Uh, Sutherland's of Port Soy have been smoking salmon for 100 years, originally wild salmon. Uh, now uh, we have the smoke. To, uh, the salted salmon being smoked with uh, shavings from whiskey casks uh, to produce that marriage made in heaven, the taste of whiskey on the smoked uh, salmon, which I so enjoy, particularly if it's a knock uh, Glen Deveron or Glen Glasser in my constituency. Now, um, th th there's a fiction is running through quite a lot of the debate, and the fiction is that the producers of farm salmon like lice on the fish. No, if there's lice on the fish, the commercial value of the fish goes down because it looks ugly on the fishmonger's uh, uh, display. The fiction is that mortality is something to which the salmon uh, farmers are indifferent. Every time a salmon dies on a fish farm, that's lost income uh, to the salmon farmers. So don't let's pretend that the industry doesn't want to engage on the genuine and properly expressed uh, challenges uh, that they meet. Uh, Donald uh, Cameron referred to Loch Fine as an attempt to show the linkage between fish farms and reduced uh, salmon runs. Um, Martin Jaffa's book does refer to uh, Loch Fine in relation to sea trout, same species essentially, and the, the three rivers that go into Loch Fine, the one with the greatest reduction is the one where the fish don't swim past the fish farms. The one where they have to swim past all the fish farms has seen the least reduction. There are many, many causes of reduction in the number of salmon in the wild environment. There are many things that affect both uh, salmon farms and the wild environment. Uh, when I and my brother were water bailiffs for the Tay Salmon Fisheries Board in 1968, the whole talk of that season and previous seasons was in the reduction of fishing. Why did that happen? Well, there was illegal exploitation. Uh, we experienced as bailiffs dynamite, hangnets and sniggering. I actually arrested somebody for sniggering on the island in Perth, which is an illegal method of catching fish. We had the Klondikers from Russia sitting in Loch Broom with their uh, own vessels out there catching salmon offshore. When the limits, of course, were three miles and 12 miles, not the 200 miles that we experience today. We had uh, predation. 
uh, from uh, things like seals, the closing of the wee banky, the Sprat fishery out in the North Sea in the 1970s, caused a quadrupling in the number of seals in the North Sea. And guess what? Seals like eking salmon. Now, it's not one thing. It's a complex environment of different things. Um, I first saw my sea lice in the 1950s. Uh, unlike Jamie Green, I've, uh, while standing on the, the bank trying to catch with rod and line salmon, and my failures, I merely look in the mirror for the cause because I'm an indifferent fisherman. It isn't because there weren't fish in the river. Um, I can't judge because I've never seen him fish uh, Jamie Green's competence. But sea lice I saw at that time. We've got crayfish in our rivers that consume almost anything that is there. You now have rivers where there's nothing but crayfish uh, left uh, in the rivers. We've had acidification of rivers because of uh, the artificial fertilizers that are running off uh, farmland. Uh, we've got rising temperatures in rivers. We've got clearing of vegetation on the edge of rivers that is allowing pollution and cattle on the edge. The products of the cattle being there are going into the rivers. We've got other examples of where uh, we've had dredging of uh, things out of rivers which make it more difficult. Now, there are things that are good as well. We've got dams and weirs. The Pitlochry fish ladder, famous for supporting the proper passage of the river up. We've other examples elsewhere. Let's not turn this into a simple-minded battle uh, between the fish farms and the wild fish industry. It is a much, much more complex issue. I wish our industry every success in the future. I will continue to enjoy eating their products, but I will also watch with interest as we regulate in an appropriate way. Presiding officer. Thank you. And if we move to concluding speeches, Colin Smith to be followed by Peter Chapman. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Today's debate has shown that the business as usual for salmon farming in Scotland is not an option. Industry has been encouraged by the Scottish Government to hit their ambitious growth targets, but the Government have not yet put in place the necessary regulatory framework to manage that expansion in a way that properly protects our environment and animal welfare. As a result, environmental and welfare shortcomings are in danger of adversely impacting on the economic and social benefits of salmon farming many members have highlighted in this debate. Let's be clear, the committee also highlighted those benefits. The very first sentence of the report states that the committee acknowledges both the economic and social value that the salmon farming industry brings to Scotland. The report goes on to highlight that aquaculture is worth £620 million a year. It supports 12,000 jobs, often high-skilled jobs, jobs of huge importance to the peripheral rural communities they serve, which can be fragile with limited alternative employment markets. In their public evidence to the committee, Greg Seafood Shetland set out the broader social and community benefits these jobs provide, stating they help, and I quote, to support sustainable rural communities by providing year-round stable employment. This, in turn, helps to keep rural schools, post offices, shops, and community halls open. So the economic and social contribution of salmon farming was well aired during the committee's inquiry. But it's because of the importance of that contribution that unless the government and industry tackles the environmental and animal welfare issues highlighted in the report, the industry will not grow in a sustainable way and those economic and social benefits will be put at risk. And it's not just salmon farming itself that risks being undermined by the type of poor practice highlighted in the REC report, or indeed the previous report by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Finn and Creole Fisheries told the REC Committee that salmon farms can make their work more difficult and potentially dangerous by pushing these industries out of the most productive areas. And others raised environmental damage being done to marine tourism and also wild salmon. So what are the issues that could well undermine salmon farming that we need to tackle? Well, as several speakers have highlighted during the debate, farm salmon has exceptionally high mortality rates. In one kind's written evidence to the REC Committee, they stated mortality rates are estimated to be over 20%. In 2016, over 10 million salmon died on Scottish salmon farms. Recent data published by the Scottish Government on the Scotland's aquaculture website suggests this figure increased to over 11 million in 2017. The committee highlighted that there were particular sites with especially high mortality rates and made clear we believed expansion should not be permitted 
at these sites. There are also recommendations on the need to collect more up-to-date data on mortality rates, and the committee rightly called for a far more tangible and far more tangible enforcement powers, such as the ability to prevent expansion at sites with high mortality rates and a mechanism for limiting or closing down production when particularly severe events occur. Enforcement also needs to be strengthened through a revised compliance policy, which includes appropriate penalties. Well, I appreciate the Farm Fish Health Framework are looking at a number of these issues after years of problems and not one but two damning committee reports. There's still no commitment from the government to fully make the changes needed. But this is not just about placing more requirements on the sector, it's also about how we support the industry to make improvements. The committee received evidence on the frustration felt by many in the sector about the disjointed and inconsistent nature of the regulatory system. Local authorities, Marine Scotland, the Crown Estate, SEPA and the Animal Plant and Health Agency are all involved in decision making in the industry, creating a confusing and fragmented regulatory landscape. Dr Richard Luxmore from Scottish Environment Link, Link called for a single streamlined process in which a person submits a single application for a fish farm and all the impacts are considered together. Now, although the feasibility of such a system remains to be seen, it's undeniable that we do need a more integrated process. The committee's report reflected this important point. Note that the system is spread across several regulatory bodies and describing the current situation as confusing and poorly coordinated. The committee highlighted the need for significant improvements to coordination of and interaction between the various elements of the regulatory regime. Now, I appreciate there is work underway to address some of these issues, particularly with regard to SEPA's responsibilities, but further bold action on this is needed. If there was, however, one aspect of the REC Committee report I was disappointed in, it was the Committee's decision to dismiss calls for a moratorium, stating in the recommendations that there was insufficient evidence. The Committee set out the changes we need the industry and government to make, and I agree that it's only fair they should have a, an opportunity to make those changes. But if significant improvements are not made, I believe a moratorium should at the very least remain an option, which is why I dissented from the Committee's recommendation, completely ruling one out. In many ways, the committee agreed with me and somewhat contradicted itself by going on to state in the report that there should be no expansion in the industry until some of the serious problems have been sorted out. Frankly, that sounds a bit like a moratorium to me. Presiding officer, in concluding, salmon farming is too important to our economy and to communities to be managed in an unsustainable way. The future of the sector requires us to hold the industry to the highest environmental standards and to ensure they take animal welfare and agriculture more seriously. And the government needs to put in place the regulatory framework to achieve this. Work in this has begun with a number of initiatives and announcements in recent months. But we should be in no doubt this is in no small part thanks to the work of the Eclair and REC committees who have shone a light on the environmental and animal welfare failings of the industry. The recommendations of both committees provide a strong starting point for developing solutions to those failings, and both the government and industry should ensure that those recommendations are now fully delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Peter Chapman. I thank you, Presiding Officer. It has been a long process from the committee agreeing to conduct this inquiry in June 2017 to get to this point. And I wanted to begin, as many other speakers today have, by thanking everyone who helped us produce this report and everyone uh, who worked so well with the committee throughout this consultation process and during our evidence sessions. I would also like to thank everyone who hosted the committee on site visits last April, and we've had 160 written submissions of evidence, and we also met with the Norwegian Fisheries Minister, Per Sandberg. So it has indeed been a big job, and I believe a thorough process which has delivered an important report. Two things have been abundantly clear from all parties across the chamber today. Firstly, that we all recognize the huge importance of the salmon farming industry for Scotland. It provides the economic prosperity and good, well-paid job opportunities in some of our most remote and disadvantaged areas. And in these remote areas, as my colleague Donald Cameron touched on, this industry helps provide a huge social benefit sustaining rural schools, shops, and local businesses. Salmon, salmon farming has created an estimated 12,000 jobs in Scotland and has become Scotland's biggest food, food export with an estimated value of 600 million pounds in 2017. 
Scotland is the top producer in the EU and one of the top three producers globally. So there's no doubt the e economic benefits for Scotland are huge. It has also made salmon affordable. It is no, no longer a luxury food, as Gillian Martin outlined. I can well remember as well when it was a luxury food. It is also, as the Cabinet Secretary outlined, sold in some 50 countries worldwide. So it again is a huge export success story. And as Rhoda Grant told us, we should all be eating more oily fish. It is good for our health. And despite what the vegans and the vegetarians might say, I believe it is good for us. Yeah. However, the second thing that became clear during our inquiry and has been expressed multiple times across the chamber today is that the current status quo is not acceptable. More enhanced and effective standards of production and environmental sustainable sustainability must be introduced. We need to ensure that regulatory deficiencies that currently exist within the industry are addressed to improve fish health and in the environmental impact. There is no doubt that in the past there has been poor rates of compliance. And our convener Ed, Ed Mountain mentioned this point, but he also mentioned the fact that we need to make sure that we locate farms in more suitable areas in future. And I also believe that the, some of the farms that are in, in the wrong place, we need to be able to move them. And I sort of totally disagree with, with John Finney on this point, when, when I think there is a right place for fish farms to be, and there can be a wrong place for them to be as well. We also need to better understand the effect that salmon farming has on the wild salmon population. And that is a hugely difficult subject. But uh, Stuart Stevenson, I think, addressed many of the issues there and, and, and highlighted just how difficult the problems are, and they are multifaceted. Mortality levels in salmon farms are often too high. I agree with that as well. But there is no doubt that the industry takes this very seriously indeed. And I'm pleased to see that mortality levels are now beginning to fall. Rhoda Grant also spoke of the issue of escaped fish. Thankfully, this doesn't seem to be a big issue just now. But there is no doubt that moving to more exposed sites could make this more likely to happen in the future. Mike Rumbles made the important point that there was no single body that took responsibility for regulating the industry, and that he believed this was hugely a, 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 a huge failing, and I tend to agree. So many issues, and the industry should only expand carefully until these issues are addressed. And with the Scottish Government's target to grow our food and drink industry to be worth 30 billion by 2030, it is vital that we grow our biggest fruit producer, namely the salmon industry. I welcome CEPA's Finn Fish Aquaculture sec Sector Plan, which was published in November for consultation. This consultation included plans for a world leading framework for regulating marine cage fish farms. Now, this is vital work, and I look forward to hearing the results of this consultation. The focus on the necessary environmental improvements for this industry has resulted in significant improvements in sea lice numbers. Sea lice numbers found at Scottish salmon farms in September 2019 were the lowest for that month in f and have been are in the lowest for five years, uh, as Finlay Carson pointed out. Now, this has been achieved with various methods and not certainly not only by using chemicals. The use of cleaner fish is a new and important way to, ta ta to tackle this issue. And again, Finlay Carson and Mark Ruskell highlighted the dangers to wild wrasse stocks. However, the increasing numbers of these fish being grown on farm rather than caught in the wild will help to keep this method of control sustainable. Can I also say how much I agree with David Scott in his comments on Mark Ruskell's entirely negative speech, which I also did not recognize as a fair comment on this industry. No, I have no time. This improvement is only beginning, only the beginning. I, I welcome CEPA's efforts to, so far and look forward to see CEPA's implementing the Finn Fish Aquaculture Sector Plan to continue this improvement in standards and regulation. I also welcome the Scottish Government's Fish Health Framework, which expects to lead to not only a huge reduction in fish mortality, but much needed improvement in the transparency in the reporting of mortality rate, lice levels, and disease outbreaks at salmon farms. In conclusion, President Officer, I am supportive of, the, of this industry and want to see it grow, but it must do, be done sustainably with high welfare and environmental standards at its heart. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I call the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. Um, thank you, President Officer. My thanks again to the Rural Economy Committee for calling for this debate. It has provided an opportunity to discuss issues of great import to a sector which has, I believe, become, in a short period, a cornerstone of this country's rural economy. And I've been heartened by the support across the Chamber, or most of the Chamber for the industry, qualified by the need to meet the challenges that it currently faces. And to start off with Mr Chapman, I think it was very fair of him to point out that some of these challenges are already being tackled successfully, uh, namely sea lice, the use of cleaner fish, but there is more to be done. And I think that short uh, few sentences, I hope, is designed to kind of sum up where this parliament is, or where most of this parliament is, because plainly not everybody is in that place. Uh, but I think that consensus in support of a sustainable industry is something that I very much welcome. And for my part, with the responsibilities that, as Mr. Rumble said, fall to me, I will do my best to seek to uh, implement, direct, and ensure that the direction of travel of government policy reflects the tone of this debate overall. And I thought that it, this would be a useful way to start the debate because in the short time available, I simply won't have the ability to reply to every one of the many questions which was asked. I think it is fair to say that, that, uh, that, that the sector is investing very heavily to improve fish health and it has been doing so for some considerable time. And it has been doing so in some cases with success. Um, for example, Scottish Sea Farm Sustainability Report points to £11.8 million investment in fish health in 2017, 85% in non-medicinal measures, 91.3% fish survival at sea in 2018, a 50% reduction in the use of medicinal treatments, and a 25% reduction in the need for sea life treatments. Surely, these are all things that all of us will welcome. Interactions is a vital area where we're working on and addressing. Uh, and I want to emphasize that we will not be kicking this particular can down the road. I think Claudia Beamish in particular sought assurances about time limits. I think I'm going to resist the temptation to respond too specifically to that, if I may. As a minister, that's generally a prudent course to take. But in saying that, I want to reiterate my determination that we will act swiftly, but bear in mind, please, that each of the groups that we have set up, some of them some time ago, uh, require to do their work. To do their work involves considering the evidence. Considering the evidence, as we know from the committee's reports, takes time. It's a long time since the committee's reports began. Uh, similarly, we need to allow the groups, the interactions group in particular, time to do its work. And John Goodlad's leadership uh, and the technical expertise of those in the committee, I think, is a big advantage for us. So, uh, yes, I certainly give way. Jamie Green. Uh, th thanks. Uh, the, the committee came to a, a view that it didn't think that we should go far enough to say that there should be compulsory uh, arrangements between uh, salmon producers and wild fisheries. Uh, does the Minister or the current Secretary have any views on the, the nature of these types of relationships and whether they should remain voluntary or whether it should be stronger than that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the, 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 that, I mean, that's a, it's a very important and relevant question. I'm not trying to dodge it, but the primary issue is what the impacts are. That's the first thing that one needs to establish evidentially. And I think that, that uh, many members have referred to the fact that it's multifactorial. I think Mr. Stevenson referred to this. Twelve factors, I believe, at least, that can contribute to mortality of wild salmon. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, that needs to be considered first. Then, the appropriate action that should be taken uh, should be implemented. And at that stage, whether it should be done on a voluntary or a compulsory basis falls, I think, to be considered sequentially. Uh, but I do want just to ensure that members don't gain the impression or, or seek to interpret what I am saying now as in any way a sense that we wish to delay action. Quite the opposite, but it must be evidence-based, it must be orderly, it must be thoughtful, it must be considered. But in the interim, we shall be taking steps to ensure that environmental monitoring takes place. 
Uh, and uh, that is something that we will be able to do ad interim, if you like, without waiting for the outcome of the various groups that we, are, uh, we have set up. Um, I welcome the fact that many members have uh, recognized that the setting up of these groups is a serious piece of work. It is a serious way to address these concerns. Actually, it's the only way to address these concerns. Few, if any, of us are experts. We must reach out to those who have the experience and knowledge and gain the benefit of their work, pro bono in most cases, I have to say, and thank them and appreciate and value the work they're doing, and that's the approach we shall take. Now, we've touched on the importance of the sector to rural Scotland, uh, and I, I can't emphasize enough the reach and significance of the investments that are being made. Gale Force in my constituency is investing 914,000 to develop new fish farming pens. The uh, Aquaculture Innovation Center has overseen 14 projects worth 11.4 million, of which industry contributed 7 million. There are very, very substantial uh, sums of money which are being deployed in order to seek the solutions to the problems that we have discussed today. There is also substantial, no I can't because I have very little time, there's also substantial community benefit and I, would, I don't have time to go through, I've got all the figures here, but some of the major companies are contributing to the communities in which they are based and that is appreciated and we of course wish to encourage them to do more. When I visited uh, Orkney uh, some months ago, they were Scottish sea farms were celebrating 10 years operating in Orkney, I learned that the average wage presiding officer of their employee, employees in Orkney was 37,000 pounds. Let me repeat that, 37,000 uh, pounds. And I think, and I met them, uh, I met several of them, they're hardworking, they were young, or at least in comparison with me, they were young anyway, uh, and, uh, and they were all at the heart of rural communities, a point that I think Mr. Scott made very trenchantly and effectively, if I may say so. The cloud of Brexit, I'm afraid, is hanging over the sector, and it is very clear that the is approach that we recommend conclusion? of uh, the continuance in the single market is one that they would recognize. Signing officer, I wish I could have time to say more, but I don't, so I'll just conclude by very much welcoming the support for a sustainable aquaculture sector in Scotland and pledging to do my bit uh, to ensure that that is precisely what we will continue to achieve and deliver. Thank you, and could I call Gail Ross, the vice convener, to conclude on behalf of the Rural Affairs Committee. Thank you, President Officer. This has been an extremely interesting and worthwhile debate, and it is clear that there's broad recognition across the Parliament of the economic and social value of the salmon farming industry. But at the same time, there's a clear acknowledgement that action must be taken to address the fish health and environmental challenges it faces if we are to grow in a sustainable manner. And as Mark Ruskell says, we are at a crossroads. And this debate, although from our committee, also had speakers from the Eclair committee as well. And I'd like to thank them, the Clark, Spice, and everyone else that gave evidence to both reports. We've heard that the status quo is not an option. That was the conclusion of the Eclair committee, and we agreed with that. The Cabinet Secretary also stated that in his opening statement, and many other members also stated this as well. Now, this is an industry that is only as strong as its weakest link, as we've heard from Maureen Watt. The farms that are underperforming need support and guidance to perform better. And one of our asks is that we get Marine Scotland to take responsibility for improvements and assume that overarching role of regulator, as Mike Rumbles stated. This is a multi-million pound industry and everyone needs it to succeed. It's a big employer in constituencies like mine and in uniquely fragile communities. Even one or two jobs could be the difference between the local school closing or staying open. And that was also mentioned by Peter Chapman and Colin Smith. Nearly every speaker managed to state the benefits of salmon farming. Even Jamie Green managed to say something nice. And all the other conve the conveners of both committees, <laughs> the conveners of both committees and all the members that spoke 
Uh, Tavish Scott gave a robust defence of the industry and he was right to also talk about Scotland's food and drink strategy. And Richard Lyle said that Scotland's salmon is quality superior. So I won't go over the stated uh, benefits to the industry. I uh, will now turn to the contributions in the short time that I have left. Um, gill disease was one of the major uh, ch serious challenges that the industry faces. And um, one of the things that uh, the Fish Health Framework um, has action upon itself to understand the underlying factors, support for more research, establish good practice and formulate a long-term approach. And as Maureen Watts stated, the industry recognises these issues. Sea lice is another challenge, as we heard from John Mason, Finlay Carson, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but the queen of sea lice herself, Claudia Beamish, and the committee took quite a bit of, if, due to her past experience, presiding officer, nothing else. But the committee took quite a bit of evidence on this, and we heard differing opinions about how the challenge was being dealt with. We even heard disagreement about whether the numbers were decreasing or increasing. And we had a number of recommendations, including an easily accessible information source, compliance and reporting to be mandatory and effectively monitored. And I note that Alex Rowley talked about the reporting issue. Um, and as Stuart Stevenson stated, producers don't want sea lice on their fish. We talked about cleaner fish. This was mentioned by Finlay Carson, Peter Chapman, Mark Ruskell, and the Scottish Government has confirmed that Marine Scotland and the industry have agreed a range of voluntary measures for the wild wrasse fishing industry, and there are positive moves towards increasing hatchery reared cleaner fish. But as Finlay Carson stated, we'll need more and more. And Mark Ruskell stated that we might not need cleaner fish at all if we were to move to a closed containment system. Most of the members spoke about the interaction between farmed and wild salmon. As Stuart Stevenson rightly pointed out, there are many reasons for the declines in wild salmon. And a lot of people stated that fish farms only have a small contributing factor and stocks are also declining on the east coast where there are no fish farms. And I believe that Rhoda Grant stated that in her speech. Um, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of the group set up to look at this, which Claudia Beamish also mentioned. Um, I don't have a lot of time left. We talked about other things, planning the role of local authorities, poorly sited farms and how we can support the industry to make sure that farms are sited in the right places. We've had some recent uh, good news on uh, shooting of seals. Again, an animal welfare issue. Nobody wants to see seals shot and Scottish sea farms have managed to reduce the amount of seals shot by 31% last year due to using new types of netting. And I know that Tavish Scott mentioned that as well. Um, we must support this industry to strive. And I've heard and read a lot in the run up to this debate today, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank each and every person. As John Mason rightly said, we had a lot of people get in touch. I just want to say this, presiding officer, it's not about right and wrong. It's not about winning and losing. We've heard of the range of activity being undertaken by the Scottish Government via its Farm Fish Health Framework and its Salmon Interaction Working Group. We know that SEPA intends to bring forward proposals to strengthen regulation, drive operators towards full compliance and improve environmental protection. Our committee believes that it's critical that these proposals result in meaningful and tangible action which will allow the salmon industry to continue to be an economic success story whilst ensuring that it operates to the highest possible health and environmental standards. And I'm sure I speak for both committee's members in saying that we hope that our inquiry reports have made a worthwhile contribution to achieving this ambition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee into salmon farming. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 15728 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no member wishes to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 15728 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you.
The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 15723 on the establishment of a committee. Could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. Could I ask if there are any members who wish to speak on this motion? Oh, they are. Yes, they do. Uh, could I call Annie Wells to be followed by Neil Finlay? Annie Wells. Presiding Officer, we support the motion to establish a committee on the Scottish Government's handling of the harassment complaints. And we respect the rules of the Scottish Parliament, which determine the number of MSPs from each party on the committee and the rotating selection of the convener under the De Haunt formula. And we are also confident that all the MSPs who have been selected will seek to scrutinise the decisions that were made in this matter and provide recommendations on a way forward. We do, however, continue to have concerns that the convener of the committee will be selected from the SNP. And I wish to emphasise that this is no reflection on the SNP member who may be nominated for the post of convener. But there is a clear public interest in ensuring that this committee is both impartial and is seen to be impartial. And there is no getting around it. That will be more difficult to achieve in this very particular circumstance if the convener is from the same party as the government. So while we will support be supporting the motion this evening, we are disappointed that the SNP did not, of its own volition, choose to stand aside on this occasion. And we would continue to encourage the SNP to reflect further and offer the convenership to an opposition party. That, in our judgment, is the right thing to do. Thank you. And I call on Neil Findlay. Uh, President Officer, the Scottish Labour Party supports the creation of a committee into the Scottish Government's handling of harassment complaints. Indeed, we called for it at the Parliamentary Bureau. We support the remit of the committee and fed into the wording of it. We are content with the number of members proposed to sit on it. But such is the nature of the subject matter that this committee will deal with. It is essential for the standing of this Parliament that we get this right. The committee will deal with the actions or inactions of the most powerful politician in Scotland, the First Minister, and some of her key advisers eh, in relation to complaints about the conduct of the previously most powerful politician in the country when he was in office. All eyes are on this Parliament in relation to how this, Parliament, this, this inquiry will be conducted. Can this Parliament be trusted to do things openly and transparently in the national interest? This is a big test for us all. It's vital that any committee is not compromised before its work begins and that there's no perception of inbuilt bias. Now, we fully understand the Parliament operates the Dehaunt principle to allocate speaking times, committee places, etc. And according to the Convention, the next committee to be formed is meant to be chaired by an SNP member. That is how the system works in normal times. These are not normal times. Scottish Labour has serious concerns about the damage to the reputation of this Parliament if such an important committee looking at such, ser such serious allegations against the most senior politicians in, in this country is chaired by a member of their own party. And we made this clear at the Bureau. This is not an attempt to block an inquiry. It is a call for this Parliament to do the right thing. We tried to put down an amendment to this motion today to ensure an opposition member chaired the committee. This was not selected by the presiding officer. Presiding officer, before Christmas, <coughs> Professor Alison Britton's report to this parliament on the conduct of independent reviews said that the process for the selection of members should be as independent of the subject under review as possible and the appointees should have no perceived conflict of interest which may raise doubts on the impartiality or, and independence. Whilst this is not an independent review, these words are prescient and should not be ignored. We ask the government to withdraw their motion in return with a proposal for a non-government chair. Otherwise, we will vote against the terms in which the committee has been established tonight. Thank you. And I call Graeme Day to respond on behalf of the government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, over the past several weeks, business managers have discussed every aspect of this committee at Bureau and agreed the motion on behalf of their parties. A few moments ago, when I moved that motion, I, of course, did so on behalf of the Bureau. But speaking as the Minister for Parliamentary Business, Presiding Officer, I want to acknowledge and welcome the considered and constructive approach 
which characterise those deliberations chaired by yourself. The matter of the convenership was amongst those discussed, and I proposed that the SNP would remove ourselves from the nomination for the deputy convenership, which we were also due to receive under the DeHaunt allocation. Beyond that, we took the decision to nominate four hugely experienced and highly respected parliamentarians to the committee. Both approaches were decided upon before any questions were raised by other parties, a clear indication of the importance we place on this committee and the work it will undertake on behalf of the Parliament. Further evidence of this is to be found in the fact that when the committee meets, it is our intention to nominate Linda Fabiani, who I believe should have the confidence and respect of all parties in this Parliament to the role of convener. The unprecedented decision to nominate a deputy presiding officer to such a role is one which I hoped other parties would, and I know some do, recognise as pointing the way for the work of the committee to be carried out in an appropriate, non-partisan way. Thank you very much. And the vote on this motion will be taken at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of four parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the bureau to move motions 15729, 15730 and 15731 on approval of an SSI and 15732 on approval of the draft social security charter? Uh, move, President Officer. Thank you very much. Now we're going to turn to decision time. The first question is that motion 15677 in the name of Edward Mountain on the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee report on salmon farming in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question, is that motion 15723 in the name of Graham Day on the establishment of a committee be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15723 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 92, no, 19. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. I propose to ask a single question on the four parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? That's good. The question therefore is that motions 15729, 15730, 15731 and 15732 uh, in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? <laughs> We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move in a few moments to members' business in the name of Jeremy Balfour on the Scottish Power Chair Football Association. But we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>